I'm Martin Scorsese. I'm the director of the film, Aviator, and we'll be talking about uh, certain aspects of the production and uh, the making of the picture. I found it interesting when I first read the script. Uh, I didn't know what the script was about. They didn't tell me. My manager said this would be very interesting for you to take a look at. And um, in fact, uh, when I saw the word aviator, I, I remember feeling, oh, I don't know, airplanes, see what happens. Uh, but I was intrigued by the very first scene because um, I'd imagined that um, after seeing the title, The Aviator, come up on the screen, uh, the last thing you would think of would be a little boy sort of naked standing in the middle of the screen uh, as the first image of the aviator, uh, alone in a dark room. And as his mother comes into the room, I had the lights sort of fade up around him. Um, and I found that the, the um, opening scene uh, with the mother bathing the boy, but really talking more, really dealing with more of the paranoia of um, disease, so that you're, coming, you're going into a world which a parent would be concerned about their child. However, the implication in the scene, the way it's done, and the way it's written by John Logan, is that there's an overemphasis on protecting the child from illnesses and disease. Uh, it's just suggested. She talks about quarantine, talks about cholera. Quarantine being a, a very important phrase in his mind, a, a very important concept, I should say, in his mind throughout his life. Editor, Thelma Schoonmaker. I think Marty wanted to begin the film with a very uh, quintessential evocation of what Howard Hughes's life was like as a young boy. And he wanted to feature the boy alone standing in the room and then gradually bring the lights up, uh, first one set of lights and then another, so that the reveal of the mother is, is slower and more mysterious. Producer Michael Mann. Well, we called it The Aviator. It was because that was the thing he loved the most. And flying was transcendent. He transcended all the earthly problems. What was incredible about him was all the things that he built and contributed, which we take for granted, which has to do with the formation of cinema, airlines as we know them, flying above the weather. and. Um, and so, so, so the innovations are really quite incredible. Because of doing so many things with not only not only uh, building planes, uh, but that is building them with his with his with his associates, actually creating a plane, creating the fastest planes, um, uh, but also uh, creating airlines, uh, also making movies. Uh, uh, he was into he was, he was into everything until finally, I think, also distilled down to aviation mainly. I think his obsession really distilled to aviation. And so much a part of the, real, the, the world that we live in today uh, has elements of what he's done, even including satellites. He was, uh, uh, wanted to be everything, scientist, uh, daredevil, um, test pilot. Uh, he wanted to be it all. You're my voice now, make them understand that. Look, some of those fine folks down there still call me Junior. You tell them it's Mr. Hughes now. You bet. I mean, there are a lot of things that later on in his life, or even then, people could read these biographies that are around of his about him, you could say, oh, I, I totally disagree with what he did there at this time. I, I, it's a horrible uh, stand to take on that issue, on that, on that, uh, on that situation. But ultimately, I mean, um, we're dealing with the younger Howard Hughes, and we're dealing with someone who's out there to uh, uh, change the world, really. Uh, yeah, it's about pride, in a way, and, it, and pride really kind of does him in, ultimately. Uh, his own genes do it, in a way, that the obsessive compulsive disorder takes over. And, the key there is, is um, to deal with, through Leo and his interpretation, the empathy, uh, the emotion, uh, the feeling that one would have watching this man lose control. I mean, what we're trying to deal with here, with Howard Hughes here is the humanity of Howard Hughes. Even if in his later life he becomes the image of some sort of a monster or something, but there's still the humanity there. And that's, that's what we wanted, that's, where we, that's where, we, um, uh, where, we, where we created the foundation of the character. Dante Ferretti and uh, Francesco Los Schiavo, who's, who's his wife, they basically put back on, on the map, so to speak. They literally recreated the Coconut Grove, just, just I think, a foot or two wider than the actual one. Um, and also recreated the exterior of the Chinese Grauman Theater, because we try to, we try to lay it out in Hollywood uh, with Chinese Grauman Theater the way it is now, but there's so many buildings around that we would have to uh, digitally uh, erase, and it would take so much. You couldn't tie up the traffic on Hollywood Boulevard, so it was easier to build 
uh, the exterior in a parking lot, which is what we did. And that was bigger, actually, than the actual Chinese Grauman, uh, just to be able to get the cameras in there and get the people going. So this is something that t tons of research was done on, let alone the research done on the airplanes. The other thing that I liked about um, the representation of Hollywood in the film was, yes, you saw a couple of films being shot, but that's not, that's not really it. Uh, what really is it is the, um, the uh, Coconut Grove itself changes from the 1920s to the 30s to the 40s. And in the 20s, you have uh, a certain look, uh, particularly the use of the color. Um, I wanted uh, uh, the color in the film up to about 1937 to reflect a color that style that I like, not a style, but a technique, which uh, at the time was the best they could do in Technicolor, which was two color. I think red and green, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, until they were able to get three color in there. And then, then things change around the three color period. That's around the time she he goes to visit her family in Connecticut. That becomes three strip Technicolor. But um, the two color in the, in the 1920s uh, uh, sequence of the um, um, Coconut Grove, uh, the 20s, the costumes, that's exactly the costume of the cigarette girls at the time. All of that was pretty, pretty much very accurate. Um, and the two color, somehow the leaves are blue. I kind of like that. Um, and in a way, I guess that two color technique that we were trying to emulate, which I think we got pretty close to Rob Lugano and Barb Richardson and a production designer and Stanley Powell, all of us, we have to do it in costumes. And for example, her dress that she's wearing in the plane when he says, uh, when, he, when he takes her up and flies in the plane, seduces uh, Catherine Hepburn in the plane, it comes off as a kind of beautiful beige now or something, but actually I think it was mustard green. So we had to know what the colors were going to be like in two color. And so we designed the whole picture that way up to, up to that point in Connecticut. Um, and uh, the reason is that uh, when I think of old Hollywood, when I think of that, that time in the old Hollywood, I kind of see it in my mind as um, kind of memory, a sense memory of having seen films when I was a kid in a theater that had um, less expensive color techniques, usually two color techniques called cine color and things like that. And so they were kind of magical in a way. So I imagine to a certain extent like a little paint box of Hollywood at the time, almost like, a, almost like hand painted frames at the time, until you got into a, a full color, three strip Technicolor, and then ultimately in the Senate where things become much more modern. You could talk about the color. Certainly Richardson's uh, strength is uh, a dazzling frame, you know, which I thought would be great for uh, Hollywood of the 20s and 30s and 40s, and uh, particularly that Art Deco feeling I was talking about earlier, uh, the sense of having grown up around me, around me, the, uh, the future in my mind was images of the 1939 World's Fair, which I was not born at that time, but th that was still around at the time, and the British film The Shape of Things to Come. William Cameron Menzies designed that, and I gave that to Bob Richardson and also Rob Legato to take a look at in terms of the sense of the futuristic look of the period. Um, and Bob translated a lot of that into his visual imagery, his lighting, you know, and then going, going along with the idea also of the uh, controlling the color in the frame and uh, designing things so that they'd look a certain way in two color, and then three color, and that sort of. So uh, this is something that was worked on very, very closely by him. Howard and I were just discussing how he wants Howard to Hughes never played by the rules, made his own rules. He was uh, like an ancient Greek, uh, ancient Greek king who was the richest man in the world. He could do what he wanted, and, and he, had the, 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 he had the money to play with Hollywood, to play with the tools uh, and the toys, I should say, of Hollywood, the uh, uh, making films. Well, what a wonderful thing, you know. I, uh, it's a wonderful thing to have had. Um, I don't say he was necessarily a great director. I think, I think ultimately, um, uh, Hell's Angels and, and uh, uh, Scarface are the two most important ones, I think. But then The Outlaw is a film he directed, which I think at that point in time, uh, his obsession with flying really took over more uh, uh, than, than, with, than with cinema. Howard Hawks directed Scarface, so but uh, it, so it was a different a different situation. I mean, uh, Howard Hughes directed Hell's Angels, but some of the dialogue scenes directed by James Whale, who uh, was a great director. Um, but in any event, he just was a guy who uh, wasn't going to take anything from anybody. He went into went into town and said, "I'm going to make films this way," and uh, also pushed the level of um, always pushed the envelope in terms of uh, uh, what's acceptable on the screen, and uh, and was in the forefront of. Uh, anti-censorship, so to speak, uh, all, all his life. Uh, now, whether that was for uh, uh, believing in the uh, American uh, tradition of freedom of speech, or whether he just wanted to be a bad boy and make a lot of money, you know, on those pictures. I think making money on the picture is interesting in that that meant a lot of people saw it for him. Uh, uh, but in Hell's Angels, Hell's Angels ultimately made its money back. He said made its money back years later. Don't forget, Hell's Angels was the, the, the most expensive film made up to that time. What 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 saved him were the critics' reactions. 
at that point because it was such an extraordinary feat of filmmaking uh, that the critical reception was excellent to certain, for, for, for mostly. And ultimately, he always said, I made my money back. And the idea was to, to be a great businessman, too. Uh, so in a sense, a great businessman has got to sell something. You know, he's got to sell action, sex, violence, you know, and goes out there and does it. It may have been a man who's, who's, who doesn't know, he doesn't really know how to direct films, but he had made a few films prior to that. And one of them, uh, one of the directors he worked with was Lewis Milestone and won an Academy Award, I think, on Two Arabian Nights, it was called, uh, which is a lost film, by the way, now. He was interesting. It's almost like, uh, you'd say, a renegade coming in and, and creating a film, making a film. Um, uh, in a sense, in a sense, a guy who was daring everybody, and prov a, prov a, prov a provoker, a provocateur. His, his obsession with making the film, an obsession with the flying sequences, for example, you know, he, uh, uh, and, and the mystique and the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the eroticism of making film, too, in a way, uh, in particular. It, 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 this is something that he simply, uh, he just felt, he used the phrase, it wasn't right, quote unquote. Therefore, he's going to get it till it's right. He's going to get it till it's right. He's going to get it till it's right. So eventually, he realizes some of the flying scenes aren't working because there's, uh, from what we understand, plus there are, there are other people out there who know even more about this in terms of how it used in his films and, and his life. But in, his, in the film, where John Logan worked it out, uh, it's that, uh, you know, he realizes that you don't get a sense of speed. Uh, of, of the flying, uh, uh, the planes flying. If you don't have them, if you don't have them up against something, you need a lot of clouds. And, and sure enough, this picture did become the most expensive film ever made because of his detail. Let it. What? Who, who says we need a top wing? Who says we need? I was born in 1942, so when I, I'm about 62 now. I, uh, when I first heard of Howard Hughes, it sort of was his name on these movies I saw in the early 50s. What kind of strange films? You know, not all of them worked from RKO. To say the least, and um, um, later on, I was aware of him as a very, very probably the richest man in the world, uh, let alone in American history, and probably I think. And uh, uh, he seemed to have some some obsessive behavior in which he took over Las Vegas and uh, and then became a very strange, eccentric character. That all these stories are written about. He's steeped in paranoia and secrecy. Uh, with apparently living uh, like an old uh, ghost in a way, uh, with long hair and long fingernails and uh, uh, cleanliness phobias and uh, some men around him who were taking care of him, quote unquote, men with white gloves, uh, to say the least, uh, had his own doctors. I mean, very strange, but he also had something to do with flying, but we didn't really understand that we were younger and I, you know, that was all changed. So that that's that's the first image. And by the way, that's a terrific film right there too. But. Um, when I read this script, I, I, I was made aware of the aviator. The aviator, the word aviator is not, is not even used today. There's no such, there is no aviator today. They're astronauts. And these guys were like astronauts, these men and women in those, in those planes. That was, you see, that, that was, everybody was breaking records. It was the, it was the, it was the beginning of America as also an empire, uh, in a sense, America as, a, as, the, as the great country that it was going to become in the 20th century. And so these people, he was one of these guys, who, he, might, he might as well have been somebody in the 19th century forging out west you know, uh, politically correct or not. He was going out there and he was gonna conquer, and in this, this case, he's conquering the sky. Uh, no, th these were, there were so many uh, aviators, uh, Lindbergh and um, uh, Emilia Earhart and, and uh, uh, Wiley Post, and uh, we mentioned Wiley Post's name in the film. Uh, he was lost, he was killed, uh, uh, and so was she. I mean, so Sandy Zupre, which is fantastic, the poet, the poet aviator, you know, uh, in, in, in The Rules of the Game by Renoir, one of the main characters is an aviator. So this is, these are very romantic figures, you know, and they were out there as at the Lead Belly song that we use at the very end of the credits, says he's up there fighting with speed. He's going to that world up there, and that's the only place he was happy, you know? So I didn't, real, I didn't realize that. You know, I, I didn't realize that. And of course, reading the script and uh, getting a sense of that, and also Hollywood of the 20s and 30s and 40s, I'd love to, to get involved with that. Uh, uh, aspect of a, making a movie, but primarily it was the, um, the sheer extraordinary courage and passion and obsession to fly, to fly. I always had this feeling that, uh, I said this a number of times now, as I think about it, I love the ancient world, and I, I, as a, a hobby, I sort of read about, I read uh, ancient poetry and, and uh, uh, Greek literature, Latin literature, and you get a sense of the mythology and you get a sense of uh, how it used being Icarus, you know, uh, with the waxed wings, uh, his father making the wings for him, the way um, his father uh, designed the drill bit, got him the money to make the wings, right? The only thing is he had to fly out of the, uh, he had to fly out of the labyrinth, but he never could. He never could because the labyrinth was himself. The labyrinth was his, his madness, his, his obsessiveness, his greed, his greed, and his pride, ultimately his pride. 
his greed really is is extraordinary. I think as as a and yeah, when you when you can buy anything, you can say anything. I'll you know I'll, I'll, I'll buy make those fourteen planes. No, make it eighteen. No, 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 make it twenty planes. And he walks out of the room. I mean, come on. But on the other hand, on the other hand, those wings were great for a while, and he, he just you know flies too close to the sun. He certainly is a man of heroic stature, uh, but there are darker elements to him. There are darker elements to him. I think as you remember, as an exciting uh, innovator, entrepreneur, and um, um, a pioneer, really. The Hell's Angels happened to be one of my favorite pictures. Um, uh, I happened to see it in a 16 millimeter print at William K. Everson's class at NYU. I just, I wasn't in his class, but I kind of uh, sat in on the class that day. And in the 16 millimeter black and white version, uh, I was still at that time amazed by the uh, flying sequences because they were basically done real for the most part. There were a few models here and there, but basically it was real. And then my father had always talked about Howard Hughes and his, uh, 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 his films. Uh, and not in any, not, not in any, um, uh, uh, scholarly way, certainly. My father's a working class guy who worked in the garment district for 40 years and said, but when he mentioned, uh, when he mentioned how he used he'd say, oh, Hell's Angels, and that day was very, very impressive at the time, that movie. Staggering two million dollars. So if every human being in America buys a ticket, heck, he might even make a profit. The thing about Hughes was his, his, uh, pretty strongly audacious man. Uh, I mean, just a guy who would just break all the rules, really. I mean, even the dramatic sequences in, in Hell's Angels are, uh, uh, I mean, it, they certainly uh, suffer from certain uh, limitations of the time and, and, and situations, but the story is uh, more of the old world, the old world order of uh, pre-World War I, almost Victorian in a way, but uh, the character played by Gene Harlow is pretty tough, and uh, uh, it's, it's, he, he, he was like, uh, ultimately, after looking at Hell's Angels again for maybe 25th time or so, showing it to Leo DiCaprio and everybody, and then looking at Scarface, for example, um, my father always talked about Scarface too, and they became, Scarface and Hell's Angels became um, films that were uh, like legendary because they were no longer seen. He, he, kept, he kept, uh, kept them in a vault. And so um, these were films that were, were mentioned in almost uh, uh, revered tones, uh, very somber, not somber, but very serious mentioning of these pictures when, when, uh, by, the, by the public when they would come up. So when I saw the 60 millimeter print, I was amazed by the uh, pure black and white. I was just amazed uh, by the uh, aviation sequences and the nature of the movie. But he was sort of like, uh, he later made a film called The Outlaw, and in a sense, he was like The Outlaw. He was the outlaw of Hollywood. Heck, I say release it now and give the world his first 560 hour movie. Pat, Mr. Hughes needs this reel in the projection room right now. Enough is enough, Mr. Hughes. Are you ever gonna let us actually see this little epic of yours? Hurry up. I've been born after the period of the, the, the romantic period of the aviator. The period of the aviators from the 1920s and 30s. They were like astronauts and they were very romantic figures. And I didn't realize as much. I mean, I knew about his, his experiments in, uh, in flying and engineering plane, uh, and designing planes and engineering, but I didn't really know that he was as um, a powerful and as important a figure as a Lindbergh or, I'd say, as, a, as, as, as you know, Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart, and so many of the others, uh, Wiley Post, and so many of the other great aviators, Saint Exupéry, and uh, at that time, and uh, I, I hadn't been aware of uh, all of the uh, extraordinary uh, innovations he made in, air, in, 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 in aviation, aircraft industry, uh, in war, and, uh, and and how we live today too. We still be affected. I mean, the whole basis of commercial flying, basis on what he did, you know, uh, this whole pattern that we have of our lives is based on what he did. Um, and so his vision, really, getting people up in the plane, up in the sky, over 20,000, about 20,000 feet up, over the turbulence, is a key thing, you know. And um, so I, when I started to read the script, I was, I, I felt this was a really interesting story on Howard Hughes because it showed you the young Howard Hughes, a vibrant, alive uh, character who was, um, um, uh, nothing would stop him, also because he had all the money in the world. Uh, he was able to fulfill any dream that he had, in a way. And, and like a young person, he was uh, interested in cinema, you know, True, movies, yeah. making movies, but being a big, making a big splash in Hollywood like a producer. Because, um, I mean, really, right around that time, um, the, uh, the, the old pioneers in Hollywood, Griffith and many of the others, had shifted, the power had shifted towards the producer, really, in Hollywood. And uh, Irving Thalberg and so many others. Yes, yes. Uh, Selznick was just coming up, in a way, but uh, he was more a uh, producer or tour, in a way, uh, which also meant the spectacle, it meant the event of the film not just 
the content of the oh, film, right. but the event of how you present the film to the public. Okay. You know, and uh, and so this was something interesting. I never really, I never saw the heights from which he fell. If I never really thought about, it, I should say, the heights from which Howard Hughes fell, and I thought this would be interesting uh, because. Um, you'd see him as a young, vibrant man, full of ideas, and ultimately begin to see him being chipped away at, while he's still struggling to, to create and to invent and to um, live a life, you know, he's still struggling, but uh, throughout, despite this illness, he's able to uh, do extraordinary things in aviation, but by the end of the film, by the end of the film, he's trapped inside of his own self. More than half a million good souls lining the curb of Hollywood Boulevard. Marty had seen uh, the uh, actual promo film that Hughes himself had made of the opening of Hells Angels, and it was quite an extraordinary event. There, it was the largest traffic jam ever that occurred in Hollywood, even up to today, I'm sure. Uh, huge numbers of people turned out for it, and uh, they had hang planes hanging from over, over the streets, uh, and it was quite a glamorous affair. One of the themes of the film is that Hughes wants fame, as does Catherine Hepburn, but he also can't handle it sometimes when he gets it. So Marty designed the sequence of him getting out of the limousine with Gene Harlow and entering Grauman's theater uh, to show how horrifying it is for him when he begins seeing people reaching out, trying to touch him. Uh, and of course his germophobia would come into play there, plus just a feeling of suffocation from them all. So Marty spent a lot of time shooting very, very tight shots of people's mouths, their eyes, their hands reaching out, and it was a lot of fun to cut that sequence. We cut it and recut it and recut it, and also uh, found that uh, on, we didn't know this when they were shooting, but when the flashballs were going off on the face of DiCaprio, you could it was exposing the, his uh, eye so much that you could actually see back into the retina of his eye. And so we could we used those moments of the flash bulbs penetrating him that way uh, to great effect to great effect. it was it, it really worked out. I don't think anyone realized that was going to happen, but you can see just there's a tiny black dot at the back of his eye in some of the shots where it's really flared out, and that's his retina. So. <laughs> Um, it was a lot of fun to cut, and then, uh, of course, we had some special shots made for us by Phil Marco, who often does inserts for us of the flash bulbs uh, being crushed by uh, Howard's feet, because in those days, those big flash bulbs they used, which almost looked like flash bulbs we use at home, uh, were ejected by the camera, or they were taken out by the the photographer, that's why you see them wearing white gloves, because the bulbs were very hot and they had to untwist them and put a new one in, and they were just ejecting them onto the floor of the red carpet, and of course Howard was walking on top of them, and this was also very horrifying to him. I'm sorry, Roscoe Kerner, and this would be Gilmore. <laughs> The Zeppelin sequence of that movie is one of the best things ever put on film. And it comes right out of Jules Verne. It comes out of Jules Verne, and it's, and it's extraordinary in its, in its audacity, too, in what goes on in that scene. You know, I, I showed this I showed this 16 millimeter print uh, 10 years later. Uh, I got a hold of it in LA, and I showed it, in my, I was living in LA at the time, 1976, I think it was, 75. 75, I think. Spielberg had just done Jaws, Rorschach was there, Spielberg, John Milley, a bunch of guys said, well, you see this thing. We put it up on a little screen. They were amazed at the Zeppelin sequence. I mean, after each real change, they would get up and talk about it. Milius made a speech after the film was seen. Is this the kind of film I want to make? You know, really. I mean, these were the guys at the time. You know, Paul Schrader was there, Brian De Palma. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was a little, we were all sitting in the living room, half the size of this, watching this. And then eventually the film got restored, and then you could really see these extraordinary uh, aerial sequences the right way, which were that, that uh, they were tinted. Uh, the film had a lot of tinting and even a two color sequence. But people had never seen the ferocity of those um, uh, aerial sequences. They were ferocious. The, the soldiers, uh, the, the flyers going down with the camera uh, right, locked onto, the, onto, their, onto the, at the front of the plane looking back at the flyer. The ground is speeding, twisting. That's real. And the blood is coming out of the fellow's mouth. I mean, you know, guys are taking drinks. I mean, they've never seen anything like this before. I mean, a lot of the, 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 the flyers in the film were, uh, you know, World War I flyers, uh, uh, three or four, I think, were killed during the shooting of the film. Uh, I didn't get to see Scarface in the 70s, really, in the 16-millimeter print. Now it's been restored, I think. And it's a remarkable movie, and Howard Hawks directing. And uh, 
Uh, it's, a, it's, it's got it's a, such elegance, and uh, but it is a violent film. It's a violent film and a tough movie. We screened it again to show. I wanted to show Leo DiCaprio what he was going to top when he came into town. I said, now you, you, what, I said, what, what you have to do is you're going to have to see Wings by William Wellman, who was also a World War One flyer, by the way, and a great director, a uh, real film director. Uh, Wings won the first Academy Award Best Picture of the Year. He was going to come in. Now, Howard Hughes is going to come in. He's going to do a flying picture that tops that one. And thanks for unforgettable nights I never can replace And memories that linger like a haunting tomb It is better to have loved you dear and lost than never to have loved at all yes it's better for no matter what the cost i held the world in sway and ever for a day and thanks again for taking me on the road eventually as i say in his life uh, it, it just fell by the wayside, the filmmaking. I mean, he, he ran Arcadia Studios by that point, but by that point, it was, he, his mind wasn't into really directing anymore, I don't think. But in any, in any event, I think uh, inexperience helps sometimes. It really helps because you don't know you're not supposed to do that. You play golf on occasion. Well, how about nine holes? Now, Mr. Hughes. That was the other thing about Howard Hughes. There were so many women that you wouldn't know where to begin and end. But what John Logan did was interesting. It was basically one woman. Catherine Hepburn, a relationship that he felt, his take on it was that that was a possibility that it may have worked with the two of them. It could have worked, may have had a chance. And it doesn't, for many different reasons, it doesn't. Um, the next woman we see is not really a woman, it's a woman he's trying to create, a 15 year old girl. He's trying to create her. And that she sort of represents that whole phase of the starlets and all these people. And then the other woman, of course, is Ava Gardner, who, if you read her book, and you know, there's so many other people who know more about it than I do, but the, she's um, not as important a character in his life as, as the Hepburn character in the script. And the idea is that she was interesting to me in the script and that she treated him, she didn't take anything from him. She just fought back uh, in ways that he didn't expect, particularly uh, physically, which is interesting. And, uh, and so she was pretty tough. And yet, like his old friends came and helped and put them together at the end when they needed it. Um, she talks uh, about having, uh, she writes about having trouble with him in her, in her autobiography and then says, little did I realize, I'm not really quoting, I'm paraphrasing, little did I realize it was gonna be a 22 year friendship with this guy. Um, and so she was on a different, different level, I think, than the, than the others. And so uh, really only one very powerful relationship with a woman in, in the story, and that is with Hepburn, and then the rest is implied. Catherine Hepburn, I think, was interesting. Uh, I think they may have felt each other as being uh, unique people, very different kinds of people. That um, she may have been having, she may have had been having trouble uh, uh, fitting in. Also, I think she was uh, very unique for the time as an actress. Uh, she took a lot of chances during the 30s, the film she made. Apparently, she was uh, not appreciated in the 30s for a long period of time. She was called Box Office Poison. After having won an Academy Award for Morning Glory uh, and doing a beautiful film in the mid-30s mid called Alice Adams, she was still considered Box Office Poison. But if you look at some of the films she did during that period, they took so many chances, and she was so gutsy. Uh, she was also, I think, one of the first women to, in Hollywood to dress in, in uh, male slacks, you know, and that sort of thing. And it was a very interesting person because uh, she was uh, that Yankee temperament, I guess, that the idea of coming from a very progressive family. I grew up in the period, I was born in 42, so I was still uh, still aware of the, the 1930s Art Deco look that was around me all the time growing up. And so I feel that um, I like the look of America at that time. And the idea of the, the forward pioneer, the idea of the, the zephyr, the, uh, uh, the, the sense of uh, the uh, super chief train that was going cross country, you know, Design like uh, design like a silver bullet, as they say. Thing is, TWA needs a new plane, a modern plane. Oh yeah, what kind of plane. Okay, DC three has twenty one daytime seats and fourteen overnight berths. Something bigger. Try fifty seats with a ceiling of twelve thousand feet. No, no, twenty thousand. Think about it, Jack. What does twenty thousand feet give you? Less turbulence. Right, because it's above the weather. Jack, we want to fly above the weather. 
Only 1% of the American population has ever set foot on a commercial. Leo was so committed to this film, of course. He was the one who wanted to make it, and uh, he was so committed to it. And the, the interesting thing, it seemed to me, I don't know if I'm right, but I think I saw him growing as a person as he was growing in the part of Howard Hughes. He, it was very difficult because he had to shoot out of order a lot. It was difficult for everybody, the crew, Marty, uh, and because of actors' availability and things, he had to maybe one day be 20 years old and one day be 40 years old, and uh, that was very hard on him, but he did it without any complaint, and I, I think he would have shot 100 takes if Marty had wanted for every shot. He was so committed to the role, so anxious to do what was right for the film and for Marty that it, it was wonderful to, to watch the two of them work. And for me, as I said, particularly to watch him grow, I think, as a person as well as in the part during the, the entire shoot. You call Noah Dietrich. You have him start buying. Howard, hold on. Are you sure? You want to think about it for five minutes? Well, Jack, I got a tiger by the tail here. I ain't going to let it go. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Hughes. Welcome. Your table is ready. How goes the aviation, Mr. Hughes? I'm just fine, Pete. Oh, I'm so glad. Good evening, Mr. Hughes. Madame. It's Miss. Miss. The usual, Mr. Hughes. Please. Yeah. And may I recommend for the lady our clementine soup followed by roast wild duck with currant glaze and post pears and rose sauce. It's truly divine. Yeah. That well, Marty was just uh, so... Uh, good at shooting the musical numbers in the film uh, with wonderful camera moves and uh, dramatic introductions of some of the singers. For example, one of my favorite moments in in the the uh, second sequence in the Coconut Grove is when the singer stands up into frame uh, and starts singing Happy Feet. I just think that's the, it's such a wonderfully startling moment. <laughs> and it always gets a huge laugh uh, from the audience. So Marty always thinks out very carefully how he's, designs very carefully how he's going to shoot musical sequences. He loves them. Johnny Meyer, I suppose you could call him my uh, press agent. Pleased to meet you. Love Janelle Savage. Well, too fine. I'm sure you know Errol, right? Mr. Flynn. They're all enjoying themselves at the Coconut Grove, and Errol Flynn comes over and uh, causes trouble at the table, and, and they're just overlapping dialogue and that sort of thing. We really wanted the energy of the period, you know. And that could be any. That could be in any, any time. It's just the nature of the place itself, where everybody's together and drinking and having a wild time. But uh, there seems to be something frantic about the uh, need to. Uh, uh, enjoy oneself at the Coconut Grove in those days. Uh, maybe it's the Depression, and I think they were all out of their minds, probably, and uh, who knows what was going on, but the Depression was so bad, and movies were the biggest thing in the Depression. Everybody wanted to go see movies, and the actors were just running around. And basically, you had a, a situation, I think, where to, the, the public wanted to know so much about the actors, and the studio would um, create an actor, in a way. S-E-X. It's all about S-E-X. The Western. <laughs> you know, the Western. Fornication in the Western. It isn't done over. It's not boy. real sex, Skinny. It's movie sex. Now, what Scarface did for the gangster picture, the outlaw's gonna do for the Western. Put the sex in guts and blood. When I saw Kate Blanchett and Elizabeth, I mean, none of us were around when Queen Elizabeth I was, was uh, you know, uh, uh, hanging out in the uh, palace, so to speak. So, um, yet, Blanchett's performance was so strong. Uh, I should say... Um, comfortable. I felt, yes, I felt comfortable with watching that Elizabeth. In other words, I, I really believed it was an aspect of what could have been the real Elizabeth, you know. Uh, or at least she touched into a certain thing with a woman with power, who had to fight for that power, um, uh, who came from a family in which uh, everybody's being killed, basically, and she wound up being alive somehow, and then winds up being the queen of the country. And I think that was really interesting for me, because she has an authenticity is what she tapped into, an authenticity. Um, then I saw in a movie called The Gift, which is a very good film, I thought, and um, Sam Raimi, I think, directed, and, and she plays a woman in the South who has a, a gift of uh, extrasensory perception of some sort, you know? And um, quite honestly, I didn't know it was the same woman. I didn't know it was the same, same actor, really. I gotta, I gotta go. If you'll excuse us, we have, uh, we have to be somewhere. <laughs> you are somewhere, Howard, you madman. Somewhere else. Excuse us. Charm, gentlemen. Do help yourself to the poach pears. I hear they're divine. 
Howard Hughes, ladies and gentlemen. Was that meant for me? My hero. God, all that Hollywood talk bores me, silly. As if there aren't more important things in the world. Mussolini, for one. Where are we going, by the way? I feel like a little adventure. Do your worst, Mr. Hughes. I, I come from a time in making films that, um, more of the independent cinema coming out of the East Coast, I guess. And there's some coming out of the West Coast, too. I mean, Easy Rider used uh, uh, source music, you know, Mean Streets source music. And that's the way my life was sort of well, growing up. I heard music all the time, different music coming from different windows. And uh, I, was very much, I was very much living in the period of swing music. Um, um, the first music I heard was by Django Reinhardt and the Hot Club of France. Um, I had those 78s, actually. My father had them. Um, that, a lot of it found its way into this film. A lot of the music of Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, uh, Harry James found its way into this film based on the music I was growing up with and uh, music of the 20s also that we, uh, that we were able to find and that I felt was applicable to the scenes. Howard Shore gave us a score that was um, something that sort of reflected the mystery and I think um, kind of the energy, the energy of Howard Hughes ultimately. But the mystery of Howard Hughes, if you watch that first scene, if you watch him in the screening room um, after he's told he has, to, uh, he has no more money to finish Hell's Angels and he says, Mortgage Tool Co. And John Riley leaves, and he touches the edge of the chair, and he starts to feel something on the chair. And listen to that. The music has a certain anxiety to it, and also the use of castanets, which is something Howard Shore wanted to do because I thought it was interesting because of the Southwest, the idea of the pioneers out there. Where, where can you test planes? Well, in an open field, an open area, the desert. It's perfect, the Southwest, you know, Spain and Mexico and all of that sort of thing. His house in Muirfield has a little bit of a Spanish design to it in a way. And so... Um, uh, the influence of Spain is very important in the Southwest, of course, and so he utilized that, but it also makes things a little edgy with the castanets, and I kind of like that a lot. And so um, it represents anxiety, but also uh, uh, his, his drive, his obsession, his spirit, really, particularly when he takes off in the, uh, the Hercules at the end. But the rest of the film is imbued with uh, and saturated with, uh, with, with source music of the period. Yeah. There's a rather alarming mountain heading our way. We'll pull back on the His obsession with speed really is the idea of trying to capture on film the sensation of what it is to be a god. Because you're like a god. You're flying up there. You're flying through the clouds. You're flying, you know. No one can touch you. And I think ultimately, uh, due to his loss of hearing and, and apparently from what we understand, uh, he really felt most comfortable when he was in a cockpit. Uh, you know, and he used the, the planes too to uh, uh, be... Uh, uh, be the, the, the main, the main um, instrument of uh, seduction for women and get, take them up in a flight and take them out there. And it's a very nice sequence with uh, uh, Leo DiCaprio and Kate Blanchett in that, in that uh, Sikorsky, which is so beautiful. <laughs> that was something Leo wanted to make sure that they understood that uh, the milk looks over at Catherine t get, offers her a drink then takes it back and then he thinks he will drink from it, knowing about his a cleanliness uh, uh, phobia and his uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, whatever whatever he develops into, he 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 does that and he shares that with him. And he was saying yesterday it was about also about the the idea of his it ties in with the idea of his mother, the mother's milk, uh, the clouds, his breasts, everything uh, that we you know is there in the film. It's kind of fun in a way because there's a lot of hidden, uh, sometimes maybe not so hidden uh, elements that were there. I'm not an expert on Howard Hughes, but. The sense I get is that the period of time that he was with Catherine Hepburn was, was a was a, a time when maybe his life was calmer, and where he had a real home that he could come home to, and um, uh, so I I think she was very very important in his life. Uh, Kate Blanchett was such a marvelous discovery for me. I um, had never worked on her footage before, and she was right away so startlingly good. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it was just a delight to see it. Uh, and she's much more of a first take person than, than some of the actors that Marty works with. He, he and actors like to work together building a performance and they say, oh, let's try this and, and then we'll try that. and uh, Let's try moving a little darker here or a little lighter this way. And, and they have a lot of fun on the set doing it. Kate is one of these people who just nails it sometimes on the first take. It's just astounding. She just hits it. She prepares really, really hard. 
She studies and her accent and body language. Marty had her look at every Katharine Hepburn movie that was ever made. Um, and then she just inhabited the role in a way that was stunning. Uh, I just thought she had such authority with it, she stamped it. Um, and I just believed her immediately. He's obsessed with speed. He's going to fly it. He had test pilots. And he said, as I said in the beginning, when he gets in the H1, he said, what, let, have, let them have all the fun? He won't do it, you know? I mean, he, he, took that, he took that plane up there, and it was having a great time for an hour and 45 minutes, and then something went wrong, dreadfully wrong. I think he's absolutely right in taking the risks. Uh, why should I let someone else have all the fun? See you in a bit. It dealt with his, it, it was, uh, it was uh, sort of being uh, enveloped by his obsession. You know, they're just diving into it and swimming in that river of obsession. You know, what are you going to do, stand out, stand on the side and look at it? <laughs> you know, I wish I could jump in there. No, no, you can jump in. You know, it's like filmmaking. You're going to jump in. You start, very often when you start and you're younger, you know, even every time I make a film, it's the first time you look through the viewfinder and something, or you, you, you know, you realize again, the, uh, for me and maybe others, like, I don't know if I could speak for everybody who uh, makes movies, but you realize the enormity of what you're taking on, even if it's a three minute short. It, it, you know, the size of the frame, what's in the frame, what's out of the frame. And uh, that is what you're made for. That's what you're made for. That's what he was made for. I was not that experienced with visual effects work. Fortunately for us, the person who was head of the team, Rob Legato, who won an Oscar for Titanic, was a phenomenal collaborator. What Rob was doing a lot was using old techniques um, that he knew had been used in visual effects and movies way back in the 30s and 40s. Things like, for example, uh, a hanging foreground miniature where you can take a little plane and put it right close to the lens and then have people in the background. And if you do it really carefully, it looks as if a full-size plane is in the shot with the people in the background. But it's actually a little tiny plane hanging just in front of the lens but if you know how to do it right, it works. And that's the kind of thing that was done in the 30s and 40s a lot. And so he went back and started using some of these old-fashioned techniques. Um, and they're wonderful. They really worked, and they were very inexpensive. The scene uh, with the H1 plane in which uh, Howard Hughes uh, broke the speed record uh, were, were very complicated for Rob Legato because he had to combine a lot of different um, ways in which the film was shot and make it all believable as one piece because we had some footage, for example, when Howard Hughes is taxiing down the runway, that's a, that's a model, uh, a real model that we're shooting. But then once he takes off and goes into the air, then you're, we were combining, or Rob Legato was combining, uh, shots of an, a model of the plane being flown by remote control over the the mountains and uh, so that you got a feeling of the plane actually flying in the air however it was not really full size the plane so you have to be very careful you have to know how to shoot that so that it looks as if it's full size uh, i thought it was very believable but when i first saw the, the footage i thought hmm, is this going to work but it, it sure did because rob knew what he was doing um, and then he would sometimes have a, 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 a small model of the plane, for example, fly through the frame uh, with people standing on the, the ground watching it or above your head. Again, those were not full-size planes, but they were a, a, a model, but he knew how to combine them with the people so they looked as if they were full-size. Then we had a lot of footage of, of Howard uh, in the cockpit that was shot green screen with, with DiCaprio in a, in a mock-up of the 
cockpit and then combined with footage that was mainly shot from a helicopter. Um, uh, and, and then when you combine the two of them, it looked like he was flying over the strip, through the strip. Uh, it, was, it was quite remarkable to, <laughs> to see how it all came together. It took some work, but uh, Rob had sketched it out, and then I, Marty and I reworked it. Howard! Howard! How do we do? 352 on the last run. <laughs> She'll go faster. Good Lord, what happened to you? Oh, nothing. A hard land, and I cut my foot. Sit down, I'll take care of it. <clears throat> you tell me everything. You cannot imagine what it was like. Baby. If you, you are an artist imagine. like she is, and he was a great engineer and an entrepreneur, uh, you want the public to appreciate that. That becomes, to a certain extent, becomes fame. You have to know people want it. You have to know people like it. You have to know they're responding to it, you know? Uh, but then, uh, you know, in his case, the, the fame, the although he needed it and wanted it, started to scare him a lot. You see in the actual newsreels where he starts to move, about, move back from people as they come towards him, especially when he gets out of the plane on his uh, round-the-world trip and that sort of thing. And uh, ultimately, I think celebrity, though, with her was very important. She was going through a bad, uh, bad period of being called box office poison, and they were, you know, who was more famous than the other. And that could, that's very hard, a relationship between two creative people. People always talk about, uh, they always write about uh, actors or people in the in theater or film, or, uh, any creative, really any creative, um, um, I hate to use the word profession, but any creative calling, so to speak, you have people who try to be together, but often it deals with uh, something that could be very dangerous um, in that uh, there's a competitiveness between the two, maybe. And that uh, this competitiveness between the two is two artists living together. That could be, unless you're supportive, you know, you, you know where to hit the other person. You know what hit the other person, and it could be very dangerous. You, you see it when he tells her, he says, you're nothing but a movie star, you're, you're a movie star, nothing more. And that's very unfair <laughs> that he says that. Um, and so you know how to hurt the other person because you deal with the expression, the creative expression, you, you attack that, which is the very soul of that person. And that's a very dangerous thing. And that's why I think so many, it's so hard for creative people to be together you know, and I think that's shown in, in, in the relationship. As I said, ultimately, when, when he says to her, you're a movie star and nothing more, it's devastating. I've been famous, for better or worse, for a long time now, and I wonder if you know what it really means. Yeah, I have my fair share of press on Hells Angels. I'm used to it. Are you? I realize that Kate Blanchett had the technical knowledge and also the um, uh, security, I felt, the security and the courage to take on uh, a part like Catherine Hepburn. I mean, because it's really, you're right, there are many people who know Catherine Hepburn, so she's, it's, 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 in some cases, is a thankless part, because there'll always be people who say, well, she's not Catherine Hepburn. Well, no, she's taking on an aspect of what Catherine Hepburn could have been or may have been. Now, if you don't know about Catherine Hepburn, if you don't know anything about her, let's say the next generation of people don't know. As the years go by, people may, it may fade from memory. You will still have some footage left of her and some films left of her, we hope, but she won't be as present in the American state of mind or the world state of mind as she is now. Um, but if this film is ever around, people will be seeing this character up there on the screen, and they'd be seeing a character. They'd be seeing a Yankee. They'd be seeing a woman who's opinionated and feels strong about her opinions, and she's absolutely right to feel that way. Look at the golfing scene where she's talking about Ibsen, you know. And so I think that in and of itself, she's created something of value and something that is honest and authentic. And so uh, that was on two levels, you see. Then you add to that Catherine Hepburn. She can't imitate Catherine. So she has to get a, a kind of essence of Catherine Hepburn. And so what we did was, she actually told me, she saw a still of hers, Catherine Hepburn, it's, it's available, some of these beautiful stills that were taken in the 30s, uh, in which she's sort of uh, squatting on the ground, hunching on, hunching on the ground, and she said, she was out there, she said she was just open, and she would just say as she felt and behave as she felt. That's the impression I get from this body language from this still. Not all the time, of course, but from this still. Uh, if you look at the first time he sees her and she, she's, on, she's on the beach, that's the position she's sitting, she's sitting in, of that still putting on the makeup. And so that was her way in to the character, that body language in a way, the body language. And you see it certainly in the golfing scene and everywhere else, uh, the, the, the tilt of the head, uh, which she, you know, picked up from uh, 
watching and studying the Katharine Hepburn films. And what I had her do was watch every one of the Katharine Hepburn films on a big screen from 1931, I think, or 30, whatever. The first one is Bill, A Bill of Divorcement with John Barrymore through Morning Glory all the way up through uh, Spitfire and um, uh, Ale um, oh, uh, strange one that they're making on the beach, uh, Sylvia Scarlet. <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting film. Uh, Alice Adams, all the way up to Philadelphia Story. So I had to watch the whole decade of, um, of Catherine Hepburn uh, up to 1939. Because by the time she did Philadelphia Story, she was re-ensconced, so to speak, re, re, uh, uh, rehabilitated so into the community, the industry. She was accepted again for whatever reason. Uh, uh, it's a great part. And I believe also that Howard Hughes bought the property for her or made it possible for her to get that property, the Philadelphia Story. And this is long after they've been broken up. So uh, in terms of uh, liberties that were taken with the chronology or behavior in the story and the film, we feel that emotionally it's accurate in terms of him, and, um, of Captain Hepburn and, him, him, and, and how it used. Emotionally, it's accurate. Out of New York. He heads for Alaska, most hazardous hop of all. Continuing the terrific pace, he comes home, bringing new laurels to American aviation. Howard Hughes and his crew may find more worlds to come. You're not gonna believe this. Just came across the wires. Howard Hughes has bought control of TWA. I thought Mr. Hughes was flying around the world. Apparently he did it while he was flying over the radio. I have heard some disquieting rumors about Mr. Hughes. I'd like to know everything there is to know about Mr. Hughes. I'd like you to attend to that for me. Thoroughly. You know, these guys in aviation, too, they're talking fast, they're moving fast. I really believe people talk that way at the time. And I think, um, to a certain extent, particularly if you're in the public eye, it's just a physical issue. In other words, you don't have video cameras, you don't have tape recorders, you have cameras, but the camera, even when you take a still, the bulb has to come out, you have to put a new bulb in, you have to wear white gloves for the bulbs. And if you're going to ask, as a reporter, you're going to ask, ask a question, you've got to get your question in over the other questions being asked. That means they're shouted and they talk, they talk quickly. And so... Um, Dealing with all the people in the film, the characters in the film are all pretty much public figures. And they have to behave that way, and they're used to that kind of rhythm. As, as he gets older and, and, certain, and certain sequences, a lot of it is in, in, in uh, uh, Leo's uh, perception of how to play the scene, and also different levels of uh, manifestations of, of, this, uh, uh, of these obsessions. Um, we had to have a chart, basically, uh, of what manifestations uh, could occur in this particular scene uh, at that time in his life. And um, even though we shot out of continuity, he could always refer to the chart and, 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 and basically uh, play around with ideas, whether it's um, um, uh, a coughing, a nervous cough, or uh, uh, the uh, thing we noticed, of uh, whatever footage was shot of how would use, it kept sort of touching his pant leg this way and went to introduce that. And very often, because we were out of continuity, he said, do you think I should do the pant leg? And I said, I'm, I, I tell you what, it may be too soon, but since we're in that position, let's get one take and do it. Uh, things like that. And we experimented a lot like that. Uh, ultimately, this was weeded down and, 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 and uh, uh, sort of chipped away at in the editing, editing process, where we begin to notice there's too much of this, too much of that one, until ultimately it had to build to the final sequence um, in the uh, uh, screening room, where he locks himself in the screening room, uh, to be the most extreme, we thought. Ultimately, for me, it was the nature, the emotional perception, his emotional perception of the objects or the infected areas. It's how he saw them. That means that it's the angle of the camera and it's the, it's the size of the frame. And uh, do you do it from his point of view? Do you do it from uh, a side? It, it, it went on and on like this and actually uh, was part of some more enjoyable aspects of making the film uh, because, um, for example, and there's a scene where uh, a gentleman has polio and is in a, in a men's room and he says, could you pass me a towel? Could you uh, reach me a towel? And uh, Howard Hughes uh, looks over at the towels, a stack of towels. Uh, he wait, his head moves. We see Howard's point of view with the towels. That means that the camera's aiming down from his eye line, and the towels are looking up at him, as if to say, dare to touch me. Now, cutting back to Howard's reaction, um, it's from the point of view of the towel. 
And so we were, we were I, was, I was really getting very, very much involved in the almost a, um, a sort of a, uh, an animation or, 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 or of the actual objects or the infected areas of the plate, uh, many different scenes, particularly a scene with the doorknob. A scene with the doorknob becomes uh, rather important. Forget it. No, no, I'm a vain, preening ass without a single redeeming feature. Well, that's not true. You have very good teeth. <laughs> Come on. I've got a better idea. Take me flying. Or, or better yet, I'll take you flying. Do your worst, Miss Hepburn. Some of these days, you're gonna miss me, honey. Mainly the, the pace of the 20s and 30s scenes were, uh, it was important for me to understand that Marty wanted this brittle kind of uh, feeling to the dialogue sequences. Uh, in other films I've worked on with him, for example, Age of Innocence, we did the reverse because we were dealing with New York at the end of, of the 19th century, uh, where everything moved slower. We slowed down our pace a lot, and we used a lot of dissolves. Here, it was a more brittle kind of feeling. So that was the, what I was striving towards in order to give Marty what he wanted. Sorry, we're late. Come on. This is why the young Hughes was the most interesting. We see him as a personification of, of, of kind of the American character. And that is that he was, he, was, he was kind of up from below. He was up from the earth. He wasn't self-made, but his father was self-made. And they made their money by working hard. And so he had his entire life, he had a real distaste for patrician hi-hats, as he called them. So he was kind of an anti He was a billionaire who was an anti-patrician um, populist, if you like. And that was his antipathy towards the Hepburn's family, towards Juan Tripp towards the self-entitled beautiful people who weren't the beautiful, weren't like the beautiful people of the 80s. They were the beautiful people of the 1930s during the middle of the depths of the worst depths of the, of the Depression. These people were buying expensive cars, considered themselves the best people on earth, and indulged themselves in rather fabulous ways. And it was offensive to Hughes. I think what's happening there is he is not, he is not fitting in with the family and his seeing Kate behave a different way, especially with her ex-husband there. You know, I mean, it just becomes like, why is ex? Okay, their ex-husbands all life, and people have this marriages and that. But why does the ex-husband have to be sitting at the table next to you, uh, and your family's treating him as one of the family, and uh, you're all talking about your own? You know, it, it becomes it becomes not fitting in really with with a group of people who feel. Um, and I say, I must say, I think uh, reading about the family, they were very progressive, and very unique. Um, uh, you know, but it might have been very tough to be around them, you know, if you were an outsider. And I think uh, more to do than with just money. It has to do with uh, uh, who is Kate at this point, really? Who is she? He says, you know, you were in there. I, I, you know, you weren't yourself. She goes, I'm one way with them, but I'm, I'm your Kate, she says. You know that. I think that's what a lot of it was. His, his, his attack on them about the money um, is, is just, I think, an excuse, really, as an excuse, because I think ultimately, yes, he comes from a rich family, but they made their money on the drill bit, you see. They made their money. This is a, the family that she's in as a family that had money for a long period of time, from what I understand. Um, and it's kind of easy to point at, easy to poke at that. But he had to retaliate in one way or the other, in dramatically in the scene, and he chose that. But ultimately, I think it's about her being a different person with the family and not really seeing that he could, not really knowing her anymore. You remember that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But when you're dealing with uh, Eva Gardner or Kate, uh, Kate Hepburn, and you're dealing with somebody that can't be seen on television right now, you know, practically every day there's one of their films running. But that doesn't mean, though, that what a person who's 21 years old or a 15-year-old or a 12-year-old is seeing uh, The Philadelphia Story or Sylvia Scarlet or Magambo or The Bedford Contessa is going to have the same impression that we had, me speaking, I'm 62, that I had back in 1950 two when I saw, 53 when I saw Barefoot Contessa, or 52 when I saw Magambo, or, or when I saw uh, Catherine Hepburn working in, uh, at the present. In other words, in, 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 its, in its context, Pat and Mike with Spencer Tracy, uh, The African Queen with Humphrey Bogart, and then going back on seeing her older films on television and all that. So I, I didn't know even then when I saw her older films that during the 30s she was considered quote unquote box office poison after having won an Academy Award. Uh, so that, that if one, we hope, we, we worked on the film, the script, and the actors in such a way that we hope that if those 
of uh, those people who do know of Catherine Hepburn to a certain extent could feel that, yeah, this is a, a sense of Catherine Hepburn and, and Gardner. And there are those who, who don't know and may not know until later on or may not be interested to know, but at least then we have a person who's a very strong character, uh, the Yankee character, you know, a Yankee coming from a socially progressive family and uh, a force of nature the first time he meets her, you know, on a golf course. Force of nature, you know. Uh, and somebody sort of disarmingly uh, uh, extra extraordinarily beautiful uh, for who she is. And I think that's uh, something Kate Blanchett really created. Really, though, darling, you can't retire from the field of battle like that or they'll never respect you. Katie, I don't understand. You're like a different person in there. Oh, they just expect me to be a certain way. There's only one real Kate. And that's your Kate. And over in Hollywood, aviation tycoon Howard Hughes seems to be cooking up something big. Even as he edits his newest motion picture, he's been secretly meeting with the U.S. Air Corps. The Outlaws of Film is very interesting. I, I'm not a fan of it. I'm not a fan of the picture. Um, I think he, I think something went wrong there, and I think really maybe it was he had already had several plane, a couple of plane crashes. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, I think he was trying to control such. A, he was trying to control the uh, um, the movement in the frame of the actors in such a way. There were number sometimes um, eighty takes, forty takes to eighty to one hundred, and some some points. I know uh, some of the old, uh, some of the great actors there, Thomas Mitchell and uh, Walter Houston, uh, did did become extremely frustrated at that point at certain points. Jane Russell was her first film, and Jack Butellis was his, his first film. They were fine, and it's uh, again pushing the the bad boy, pushing uh, pushing the. Uh, the envelope of uh, censorship, and uh, but the outlaw, I think, uh, suffers from uh, from uh, obsession over uh, direction in a way. A director has to be obsessive, but here I think in that film you might see the obsession over over the direction in a way and the writing of it. All right, boys, <clears throat> I want you to rig up something like this. And there are many other films that could be made about how it is, but what's interesting about this one was that it was dealing with only 20 years of his life, whereas. Uh, if you ask me to do a film on Howard Hughes or some other characters in my time, I've, I've gotten bogged down in biographical films because I want to tell the whole story, starting with the boy and going to the very end, their uh, the, the death. And this, and I think a lot of people were talking about doing Howard Hughes films, uh, wanted to tell the whole story in a way, or the aspects of the whole story. There's so much that went on that he did till his 70s and his 70s until he died. Um, but at least this, this narrowed it down and gave us the essence of what he was and what he was to become and what he was to sacrifice about himself. Uh, really, ultimately, ultimately his sanity and his life being sacrificed, really. Um, and I thought Leo would be great because he would, he was old enough now to play the younger Howard Hughes in his 20s, and that would be interesting for him to take upon himself the transformation, the physical transformation and psychological and emotional transformation of the Howard Hughes uh, into his 40s. And I know we can mold that together. I thought we could do that. And uh, I knew he was ready for it. I just felt it because I think he was, sort of, he was still young when we did, uh, he was still like a, a boy in a sense when we did Gangs of New York. He was still a Amsterdam, the boy who grew into a man by the end of the picture. Here, here I could just imagine him directing those planes in the air, you know, when I, when I read the opening sequence. You know, nothing was going to stop him. Let's do it. And I think that's the way a lot of very talented, brilliant, young, uh, creative people are. Yes more prominent than other memories have been up on the screen. So that the sequence where Hughes uh, defends himself against the MPAA, attempts to censor his film, uh, is actually, partially comes out, I think, from Marty's own appearances there to, to defend Casino, particularly, uh, in, and he won that fight, actually. Uh, but w w one of the great things about it is that Professor Fitz, played by Ian Holmes so beautifully, uh, is there, and he has no idea why he's there, and it suddenly becomes clear to him during the, the meeting that he is expected to defend Howard's uh, showing of the cleavage of Jane Russell, and he had no idea that that was going to happen, and he just does a great job. Uh, wonderful humor in, in his performance, all improvised, and in fact, towards the end of uh, each one of the sequences where he goes over and talks in front of the, the, the large blown-up photographs, um, you can hear Marty laughing on the track because he was so funny each time. He did it differently every time. Uh, he was so funny that Marty was, was cracking up. Uh, so that was really beautiful. But uh, Marty said that one of the things about people who worked for Hughes was that 
they actually kind of liked that. They never knew what he was going to do. They never knew what position he was suddenly going to put them in. And this was sort of a, a evoked that kind of thing that they actually loved about him, but must have been a bit terrifying. <laughs> So Professor Fitz has really been hired as a meteorologist, and suddenly he's being presented by Howard Hughes as being an expert in measurements uh, and uh, makes the best of taking his calipers and going over there and measuring the cleavage of the actresses. Dateline Hollywoodland. Movie tycoon Howard Hughes must have the greatest job in the land. Each and every night, the lucky guy has to escort a different beautiful woman to a different dazzling event. The TWA king always talks up his airline as he escorts... The massive airplane that Hughes built, the Hercules, uh, sort of derogatorily called uh, the Spruce Goose by many people uh, because it was made of wood, uh, was actually quite a fantastic feat. Uh, the, if you look at it in the film, you'll see that it very bears much resemblance to the way our planes look now. So he was way, way ahead, as usual, with his ideas. Because uh, he could not get aluminum from the War Department to build the, the plane, which it normally would have been built from, he was forced to build it of wood, which was, when you consider the size of it, absolutely insane to think that a plane that big could take off if it was made of wood. And of course, nobody believes that it would take off, but the wonderful thing that happens at the end of the film is that you see he knew it would take off, and uh, you see him actually get it into the air for a short period of time. Huh? Every time there's a picture of you with another woman, it's like a slap in the face. Don't you understand that? Oh, that's overstating it. Just, oh. just a bit, Joan don't you Crawford, think? Joan Crawford, Ginger Rogers, Linda Darnell, Joan Fontaine, and now Bette Davis, for God's sake. Look, they're, they're crackerjack candy, honey. They don't, they don't mean anything to me. Oh, very nice. I deliberately on this film did not it, read very much about Howard Hughes because I knew... Darling that in order to take such a complicated life and get it um, reduced down to an area that was manageable for the length of a feature film, that they would have to combine characters, two characters in his life maybe into one, that there would have to be a certain amount of fictionalizing of the character in order to make it work dramatically. And I didn't want to sit and constantly be thinking, oh, I read in a book that you know, some more details about that scene that I wish were in the film. I didn't want that to bother me. I really wanted to see the film evolve on the screen in dailies with Marty and not be worrying all the time about what I'd read in a book somewhere. So, in fact, I'm just reading about Howard Hughes now. Uh, of course, I learned a lot about Howard Hughes during the making of the film, but I'm reading the, all the details of his life now instead of at the beginning because I didn't want it to interfere with my perception of the film. Now, there have been other films I've worked on, like Kundun, for example, where I had to learn a lot about Tibetan religion uh, in order to know how to edit the movie, so I did all the reading in advance. But in this case, I decided deliberately not to. Christ, I don't know. You tell me. We'll find some alloy that works just as well. <laughs> right. Look, oh, we can't get any aluminum. We'll just have to use wood. You can't make a 200-ton plane out of wood. Well, why the hell not? The damn thing is a flying boat, right? What did they used to make boats out of? Oak. I mean, think, think of the Hercules like a flying Spanish galleon. Spanish galleons can weigh 1,200 tons. Good luck today, huh? I think, like most people, my impression was of him as a, as a crazy old man with long hair and long fingernails and uh, hardly any clothes. I did have some sense of him having been a very good filmmaker, uh, but and a few yeah. pictures I had images of him with his mustache when he was younger. But basically, I have to say that mainly it was the the negative image of him uh, as an old man. And it was so wonderful to know that what Marty basically wanted to focus on in this film was his genius, his great uh, inventions in terms of of aviation. Um, in this the century, and he was he was a, a very very famous man during this period that we uh, that incorporates our movie. He was on the cover of Time magazine. He was extremely well known uh, because of all the exploits he was doing, flying around the world and breaking speed records in the desert, but then also flying around the world in record time, uh, constantly pushing the edge of uh, the development of airplanes, so that the airplane that we know today. Uh, is really a plane that he had a great deal to do with shaping. 
So it was. I was glad that we were going to be focusing on the the part of him that has been forgotten. Unfortunately, it's quite amazing because he was so famous in his own time, incredibly famous. But we've forgotten all about that. So hopefully, the film has brought that back to people. Every inch of her myself. She's got a top speed of 450, which means she can outrun anything they throw against her. Yeah, after the Japs stole my H1 design for their goddamn zeros, I figured I needed to do them one better. Right? Yeah, she's my Buck Rogers ship. She's a looker. Okay, what do you got for me? We were shooting in Montreal in a large studio, which allowed us to have many huge sets. Uh, functioning simultaneously, which was uh, very convenient for Marty. Sometime they were turning one of those sets around to a, to a different era. Uh, he could go shoot on other sets. But uh, Dante, again, made this a very, very large set. So high cruise power, you're looking at a top speed of around 340, giving her a range of about 3,000 miles. Uh, he was very much salt of the earth, even though his, he had inherited money from his father. His father made that money. And, um, you know, so we like that, we like that about him. Um, we identify with him because he pushed his dream to extremes that were even self-destructive, um, because nothing, nothing really ended, ended well. Yeah. Bob, you got something on your suit. Hmm? Yeah. On your lapel there, you got something on your lapel. Wow. Right there, Bob. You missed it right there. Clean it off, would you? Here. Thanks. Now throw it away. I think we look at Hughes and say, and, and, and see him kind of as a personification of the American dream for a number of reasons. One is the questing in, in, into the new, and we like to think of ourselves that way. Secondly, is there something kind of romantic about him? Because the, the, his, his idea of, of transcendence by, via flying, the avi, you know, being above things and then floating in the air and controlling an airplane. He was, he was a brilliant, brilliant pilot. I, I've talked to people who actually flew with him. And, um, you know, that whole notion is, very, is a very romantic notion. Well, more than that, you're not an American, don't have the imagination for a plane like this. Two years ahead of one trip then. How much? 450,000 each. That's 18 million for the first 40. <laughs> Hell, TWA can't afford that. The damn airline's flat broke. <sighs> Guess I'll just have to pay for them myself. Build them, Bob. Send the building to Deacon. Oh, and thank you. Merry Christmas. We have just placed the largest order for airplanes in the history of the damn planet, Howard. Lockheed just sent us a bill for $18 million. Now, now, don't you get all hysterical on me. No, it isn't good for you. This is a lot of money for some planes, Howard. Yes, yes, I know it's a lot of money. It's too damn much. You think right, I just well, got $18 million in petty look, cash? I, I should have told you earlier. It slipped my mind. Flip yeah, your well, mind. Well, you know, Kate Blanchett's one of the great, one of the three or four great actresses working today. And, uh, uh, and all her performances are characterized by courage. She, uh, she just, you know, actors, actors and actors always amaze me when, you know, they, when they're not afraid to try the, you know, high E note on the violin or, you know, kind of, you know, you know out on that high wire without a net. They just project themselves out there. And, and, and that's, that's Catherine, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's Kate Blanchett. I mean, she's, uh, it's extraordinary because it's very, very difficult. Catherine Hepburn was a theatrical personality. That's dangerous territory. That's a minefield if you're an actress to portray an actress, to portray another actress who in fact had, had a very theatrical demeanor about her. And, uh, you know, and she, she, she captured it extraordinarily. She actually does not look like anything at all like Catherine Hepburn. But it doesn't matter, you know, you get right past that. When, uh, you know, when I, when I had to figure out how to portray Mike Wallace, somebody who we see every night, every Sunday night, you know, it, 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 it's the same thing. You, you look for the inner mean? person, and you let the inner person inform the gestures and the attitude and the body language, and that's how the impression is created. It's not by, not, not, not by, not by makeup. You know, it's not the actual physical resemblance. I wonder if you even know anymore. One of the most important 
uh, factors in the scene where Kate Hepburn uh, breaks up with Howard Hughes is the writing, I think. Her opening line uh, is so beautifully written and unexpected, and she carries it off really beautifully. That's a very hard line to say. Uh, and she does it so beautifully, and then I, I really loved the way she shows her vulnerability at a certain moment when Howard says, you want to leave, we'll go ahead, and you see her just move forward just a little bit. Um, and uh, I think it's the acting and the writing in that scene that, that, that is so effective. Uh, and Howard immediately, of course, she was a very significant relationship in his life, uh, he immediately turns on her and accuses her of being just an actress, which is quite something to say to Catherine Hepburn. And there's an interesting internal thing there because, after all, Leonardo DiCaprio is an actor, and uh, delivering that line, you're nothing but an actress, uh, and that actresses are cheap in this town and he has a lot of money and he can buy anyone he wants, uh, is, is a very interesting internal dynamic going on there. <laughs> I was surprised when Marty told me he was going to shoot two sequences in the film split screen. Um, I was nervous about it because I sometimes think that it can reduce the impact of, of both images when you have two of them together. But of course, Marty knew exactly what he was doing. And one of the things that's so remarkable about the scene where Noah Dietrich uh, is talking to Howard is that Marty framed both those shots exactly right so that he got this wonderful feeling of the flames behind Howard, uh, and, which are from burning his clothes, uh, are, are overlapping into the shot of Noah Dietrich late at night, having been awakened in the middle of the night by an insane phone call from Howard Hughes. But he, he shot. He knew exactly how to place right, Howard in the screen so that the flames would overlap into the blank part of the way, into the left side of the screen, which he left blank because he knew Noah was going to be photographed later and inserted in there. And he, he framed it so beautifully. You see, that's one of the things people often don't understand is that the framing is often half the battle in a shot. I think it was always a danger that watching Howard Hughes's attitude towards women uh, could could turn off the audience, but I, I think that one of the things Marty's always been very famous for is taking characters who are not particularly likable and making you feel for them. It's, it's one of the great triumphs of his work. Uh, you look at Jake LaMotta, uh, a highly unlikable character in many ways, and yet the audience feels deeply for him. And the triumph here in this movie is that um, Marty and Leo were able to make you care about Howard Hughes, as crazy as he got, as manipulative as he was, um, and his attitude towards women is, is certainly not politically correct today. But that's the way he was, and there was no point trying to hide that. That was part of his personality. And I, I just think it, it sets up the fact that Howard is now going to go out and try and create a person for himself that will, uh, he's no longer going to open himself up maybe to be hurt by someone like Catherine Hepburn. He's going to go out and audition Faith Demurg and create her into his girlfriend the way he wants her. Dress her, change the way she looks, uh, give her grooming lessons and uh, yeah. lessons about how to talk. Doesn't work out very well, but <laughs> he had a long relationship with her. How old are you, Mr. Murr? Fifteen. Holy mother of God. The last one, The Coconut Grove, was the 1940s, and that reflects the wartime. And uh, it's a little more sedate, a little more sober. 
and some people with uniforms around. So it, it, it charts the changing of the times, really. In fact, uh, the war is declared, the war is over, and we just hear about it in, in incidental dialogue. You don't really, you don't really uh, date the film that way. You get a sense that there's a war on. And then after classes... There's no doubt that, that uh, there are some wonderful actors uh, alongside Leo in the picture, Leo DiCaprio. Uh, Alec Baldwin playing uh, Juan Tripp, the head of Pan Am, who's his nemesis, uh, in, this, in this part of his life. Uh, because he's had many lives, Howard Hughes. This film only takes a certain, uh, takes 20 years. The first 20 years are very vibrant years, you know, very, very, very uh, lively years. Those uh, from 1926 to 27 to 47. And then, of course, the women. And uh, Kate Beckinsale uh, touching upon the idea of Ava Gardner. Uh, and this is important. Uh, Kelly Gardner doing uh, Faith Demurg, uh, an actress in the late 40s or early 50s. He was doing ours. So, what are your colors? Stop fishing. <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful set that Dante Ferretti built for the Coconut Grove nightclub sequences uh, was wonderful to, to watch coming to fruition when we were up in Montreal. We were we had a lot of sets up there, and Marty could move from one set to the other uh, in a large complex. But uh, Dante spent a great deal of time creating this one for the 20s, and then he revamped it for the 30s. Uh, and the, the dialogue sequence that goes on in that scene uh, was interesting for me to edit because it was designed by the writer and then shot by Marty to be overlapped. So everyone is talking on top of everybody else because Marty wanted the feeling of the dialogue sequences he had seen in movies like Front Page, where there's this bright patter going on all the time. Uh, and normally when you shoot, you don't allow actors to overlap each other because the editor cannot get in and separate their lines. But here I had to learn how to make all of this heavily overlapped dialogue work. And actually, it turned out pretty well. We only had to, to actually re-record a few lines um, so that all this talking on top of each other actually worked out exactly like Marty wanted. To Ireland. Paris? Uh, I think in the nightclub sequences, we didn't cut that much. Uh, later, in other scenes in the film, we did we did cut a lot and trying to make tr transitions uh, that we where we had had to truncate a transition or something that was that was a bit of work to try and smooth out uh, something that had had to be dropped, for example. But in in the nightclub sequences, I think they went pretty much as planned in terms of of him revealing the musicians and the band and. Uh, sometimes we just use little punctuation, little tiny moment of a guy hitting a cymbal, for example, and that would be like a punctuation on the end of the scene. That wasn't intended by him, but but it just worked out to, for us in the editing. It worked out beautifully. Howard, I never knew you were such a good dancer. Helen? Jack? Good going, boss. You just gave away our entire post-war strategy. Ah, uh, he can't stop us. He's Pan Am, Howard. He can stop anything. Waiter, give me the largest scotch you got. Oh, what in the hell you're so goddamn giddy about? Excuse me. Uh, how should I say? It? Very often, pictures people today want an answer for everything. Why is Howard Hughes? Why was he? Why was he uh, uh, obsessed with cleanliness? Well, you know. Uh, there's a tendency to say, well, his mother was uh, over, overprotective, overbearing, his father was such and such, uh, and, and it goes on like that. Well, there are no clean answers to anything in life. And this is just a suggestion of an atmosphere he may have grown up in, an emotional and psychological atmosphere. That's what we was trying to suggest. It's a fascinating story for me because he's the richest man in the world, and yet he's not safe from himself. One of the key things that was interesting about uh, Leo in this, proce this, this project was that he had already been well read about Howard Hughes, but you can read all the books you want. You have to sort of try to behave like Howard Hughes, try to understand why the, why the behavior uh, is occurring, uh, and also put yourself in the frame of mind that, you know, there's no way you could understand it. He didn't understand it when it was happening. When his mind got locked, it got locked. He couldn't get past a certain phrase, he couldn't get past it. If he was afraid to touch a doorknob, you know, the movie's about aviation, 
gods flying in the air, giant film, giant films being produced, but also it's about a doorknob. Touch with Mr. Joyce and Mr. Berg. Those are my boys in Washington. Set up a meeting with Jesse Jones. He's the Secretary of Commerce, old golfing buddy. Whoa, slow down. Slow. We're gonna need terminals in both Ireland and France, and I wanna get some tax breaks from them. If that shit ass thinks that he owns the entire goddamn world, he's got another thing coming. Man, Am owns Europe, you know? He's smart. We ought to think about Mexico. Out of hell with Mexico, Jack. No one airline should have a monopoly on flying the Atlantic. For Christ's sakes, it just isn't fair. Look, he owns Pan Am, he owns Congress, he owns the Civil Aeronautics Board, but he does not own the sky. In terms of no one owning the, owning the sky, they, they, they were getting into a situation. I think they were getting, in my mind, where John Logan has put the script together. For what I can see, and all the research I've done over the years now, is I can see that uh, uh, they don't own the sky. Is really uh, not only is he right? They don't own the sky. It's 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 not the way to. It's not fair. Uh, but also, it's a special hollowed ground for him in a way. I shouldn't say ground, but space, hollowed space for him, which he wanted to be his, in a way. You know, uh, and that's. Uh, and they just don't own it. And I'm gonna to prove to them they don't own it. You know, and that, that's something like touching, touching some inner sanctum for him. Uh, that, besides the business aspect of it. I think, you know, there's, there's no doubt about how it uses a, uh, so many facets to him, but one of the, one of the main, main uh, uh, attributes is really his courage, his uh, um, foresight, his innovation, but also his ability at times, maybe even to, his, to, to be detrimental against him, really was, was his, was his uh, pride, I think, and, uh, and not being pushed around, you know, no matter whether, whether it's uh, head of another airline or the United States government. As he says, you know, I'm at, uh, near the end of the film, he says, I've been called many things, but I'm not a liar. And uh, he fights that in action, actuality. He actually won it, too. This is quite, quite something. But, no, there's a, there's a natural fighter in him and a, and a, uh, uh, a guy who, uh, Really, who really uh, wife, wanted to be, I think, probably the best in everything. You ever screw a color girl? You ever steal anything? You ever hurt anyone? Good night, Howard. You ever go to a communist party meeting, Roland? TWA stock. How much? 50,000 shares. 10. All right. This isn't going to be that easy. He's been making big contributions on both Alec sides. Alec Baldwin, uh, as Juan Tripp, uh, I find that, you know, the power Juan Tripp had in his hands, the, the, the sense of even his pioneering on trip, he was quite, quite, quite to do with aviation himself. You know, uh, Pan Am was a the major uh, uh, competitor to the way, but basically it was a but the Pan Am was the first major airline in a way. So, you know, I thought Alec would be really interesting playing it in a reserved way, in a reserved way, yet with a wry sense of humor all the time, particularly when he's sitting behind the door. And having that uh, business conference with Howard, who can't see Howard, but he doesn't have to see him. You can imagine what's going on in that, in that screening room. Uh, but he has that wry sense of humor, just enough to dig into Howard every now and then. Now he's vice president. Look what he did with it. No, I, I think, uh, I, I think, Chairman, what do you think? Chairman, that is interesting. Yeah. Uh, let me show you these specs for the uh, DC-4. Ava, what do you think about trains? Kate Beckinsale. Um, we auditioned for Ava Gardner, and uh, she was the first one to come in, and we liked her very much. And very often you, you, you think, well, that can't be, it must be something. And so we kept looking and looking, but ultimately, when I looked at the tapes again, I thought that she was really the best, in a way, and she had a certain authority about her, and a, um, a sense of, a real sense of the stature of a Hollywood movie goddess at the time. You know, the way she moves in the frame, Kate, and the, the application of the makeup, uh, the, the way she stands in the costumes, uh, when the door opens on her at the end, when she comes to, to clean up Howard, uh, the way the light sh just glows on her face, whether she's there in reality or not, you know, uh, she becomes like, she becomes like a, 
uh, the goddess in a way, the cinema goddess. I thought um, she had that quality about her, Kate, uh, and the way she the way she was interpreting Ava. What the hell is this? It's a present. Go on, open it. Oh, the box of trash. You shouldn't have. Keep looking. Keep looking. It's a cashmere sapphire. Best in the world. I had my boys all over the damn globe looking for this. Why? Because, look, it matches your eyes. I am not for sale. For Christ's sakes, Ava, it's, it's just a present. You can't buy me, Howard, so stop trying. Don't buy me any more diamonds or sapphires or any other goddamn thing. You can buy me dinner. How about that? Jesus, Ava. It's bad enough I have to endure those filthy gym shoes of yours, but then I get old dog. One of the things I thought was so, when I first saw the dailies, was, was very interesting is that Marty doesn't want to tip his hand about what he's going to do, so the car drives up in a wide shot, and suddenly another car just enters from the left and smashes into it. You don't expect it at all. Other directors might have cut to the front of the car coming towards them, but Marty deliberately didn't do that. He wanted to have it be as much of a shock for the audience as it was for Howard and Ava. And that at first they just think, well, maybe it's some bizarre accident. They don't realize even what's going on. But when finally he sees that it's Faith at, in the car smashing into him, he then realizes what's going on. <laughs> so I, I thought it was very clever the way Marty wanted to do that. Um, and of course he did want to use that sequence for to show the savage way that the press uh, entered into Hughes's life a lot. He was an intensely private man and he hated that. And here he is uh, in the most embarrassing of situations, going out with one woman and another woman who, who is his mistress is, is <laughs> furious about it and it's very clear to everyone what's going on. It's based on a real event. We also personify as American character because we like to think of those kinds of people as being folks who know how to do it. They know they are engineers. They know how to build it themselves. They get their hands dirty, and that was very much Hughes. When he decided, uh, if he breaks up with Hepburn, he decides all his suits are going to be from Sears and Roebuck. He drives a plain car. That appeals to kind of a uh, you know a, a, a cultural a paradigm of democracy. Or glow or something wild for God's sake. Speak up. I know, I don't give a rat's ass what he says. I'm not making a single cut. Tell him I'll release it without a scene. All right, we gotta go public with this. I'm gonna talk to her, see what kind of press he can give me, but sooner or later it's gonna come down to a vote in the Senate, so we gotta get some senators on our side. What do you want me to do? Well, do what Trip does, for Christ's sake. Set up some offshore operations. Seize up for re-election. Let's start making donations. So you want me to bribe senators? I don't want them bribed, Jack. I want it done legally. I want them bought and put a team of investigators on Senator Brewster. I need to know everything there is to know about that shit bag. Where he goes, what he says, and who he screws. Get into it right now, Jack. You got it. <sighs> Just give me a second. <clears throat> All right, what do you need? Rudder and elevators. No, yeah, these are fine. But have Simon and Pete get back to me on the hydraulic assemblies. We need a secondary system here. Okay. And listen, we need to take another look at the wheel. Jesus, the damn wheel? There were a couple of times when we experimented around, for example, when the custodian is sweeping the dust and, and Howard sees him and freaks out. Uh, Marty had intended that to be Howard looking at himself as an old man. And when I was talking to people after screenings, because we screen a lot and we talk to people a lot and hear from them what they're getting from the movie, uh, it was clear to me that people were not getting that point. They thought it was about the dust uh, only. It was about the dust, but it wasn't only about the dust. So very late, we decided to try intercutting um, images of Howard in his state of madness. So, so we decided to try and cut, intercut these images of, of Howard later in his mad state so that maybe the point would come across that he's seeing himself as an old man. And, I, and most people tell me it worked. I don't know. Some people don't like it. But that was the kind of experimentation that we did uh, with a few scenes. We didn't have to do a lot of that. I don't know. Fire. Make sure they use damp brooms from now on. Respiratory diseases are expensive, and I don't want a bunch of damn lawsuits. 
Okay, but can we at least proceed with the instrument panel we discussed? The tool shop's ready to no, go. No, I want to see the blueprints again. Look, Howard, the deadline is now completely unrealistic. At this rate, the war is going to be over by the time she's done. Now, I need you here to help consult on vital decisions, and you're off dealing with movies. You got a thousand goddamn workers waiting for you to make a decision hey, here. Hey, so Odie! Take it easy, all right? I understand you're under a lot of pressure, but it's going to do me no good if you crack up on me like that. All right? Look, take a couple hours off, all right? You just you relax a little bit. Okay. See your wife. Okay. Show me all the blueprints. All right. Blueprints. Yeah, blueprints. I'm serious now. Show me all the blueprints. How did you suffered from a me mental disease which is getting progressively worse? And it was obsessive compulsive disorder, which has to do with you see no, something bad meaning your destruction or schizophrenia coming towards you on the horizon. So you rush to order everything around you as a defense and bulwark against it. So you may be anal compulsive and a whole bunch of other different symptoms that manifest itself. And he was paranoid. And the paranoia came from a hearing deficit. He had autosclerosis, which is a hardening of the bones in the, in the, in the, in the ear. And so the little tiny bones. And so, and so he, thought that people were whispering about him just behind, just behind his back because he couldn't hear. It was one of the reasons that he had a lot of dates in airplanes because girls would have to shout. Quarantine. Q. U. A. R. A. N. T. Quarantine. The Bach music is 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 um, Eugene Ormandy's uh, orchestral versions of Bach, and uh, it's a record I had from the fifties, and I, I I just imagine all the flying scenes when I started to design them based to that music, and so I decided to use it particularly in Hell's Angels and in, in the uh, XF-11 when he's flying before it, before it crashes. Uh, it's very beautiful, very triumphant feeling, uh, particularly of all the, all the strings that he had going there on, uh, in the orchestration. Um, and uh, I'd imagine for years, um, for two years in preparation of the picture, uh, designing all those sequences based on what John Logan had written in the script as to the action and what occurs in the flying scenes and uh, the shots are designed and how they were translated to all the different techniques we used through Rob Legato and the visual effects team, um, gave them, I gave them the basic uh, tracks of Bach to, to, to play it against, and that's how, that's how we did it. It was a dashing figure flying around the world in three and a half days, four days, whatever it was. You know, he took a lot of chances, a lot of risks. Uh, uh, he was in four airplane crashes, uh, two car crashes. <laughs> uh, he, it, I think a lot of damage to the frontal lobe of his, of his brain, really. I mean, that also, I think, added to the, the complexity of his life after that major air crash in Beverly Hills. But the thing I think, yeah, I think he appreciated, I think he wanted other people to appreciate it. He said, look what he built in the Hercules. It was the biggest, I mean, now we think of a plane like that, oh yeah, the 747. We take it for granted. But the Hercules was the first of its kind, you know. Uh, have a dream of something that big, being able to fly. And he proved that it could fly. And he proved that it took off and it was air airworthy. I mean, for me, the whole story, why, I guess one of the reasons I was interested was that it reminded me, because a man who's the richest man in the world at that time, to a billionaire, America's first billionaire, um, it's like the ancient Greek kings, or ancient myths, right? I mean, where the king had everything, the Midas touch, where he touched everything and turned to gold, and then he touched his daughter and she turned to gold, and he couldn't have his daughter anymore, you know? So if you're given a great gift like that, uh, there is a drawback, in a way. And one, there's about responsibility and, and you know, all sorts of other things, but but it reminded me too of the story of, um, uh, I always talk about this, the labyrinth and the minotaur. And uh, the minotaur being the monster in the center of the labyrinth. And the labyrinth was created by uh, Daedalus um, to uh, keep the minotaur in. So he, the monster wouldn't, wouldn't go out uh, outside that labyrinth. And um, 
um, uh, his son was Icarus. And at one point, he has to have his son escape the labyrinth, and he creates wings for his son, but they're made of wax. And he says, uh, they're made of wax. The only thing is, these will enable you to fly away from the Minotaur, and away from the labyrinth, but be very careful, because if you fly too close to the sun, the, wing, the wings will melt, which is what he does. And this is, the, this is really, for me, the story of this man with that kind of power. His father did create the oil bit. I mean, sorry, his father did create the drill bit that gave him all this money. Um, and yet there was something inherent in the genes in his family that created the illness. So there's a curse, and a curse in the family through fate, not for any reason, not that there's any retribution of the gods or God looked down and said this person did something bad and that generation, this generation is going to pay for it. No, it just happened through fate, like the ancient world uh, mythology itself. Through fate, he has this fatal flaw. And, uh, and ultimately, he does fly away from the labyrinth. And the only thing is, the way I saw the story is that the monster he's trying to fly away from is himself. He can't get away from himself ever. And you see that in the screening room, ultimately. That's himself. Yeah, of course, the, the crash in Beverly Hills was so designed by Marty and Rob Legato. They had spent a lot of time with uh, uh, models of the plane in, in, in a hotel room before Marty shot the movie with a little lipstick camera that was the size, literally, of a lipstick, which Rob Legato would move around trying to understand exactly how Marty wanted to design the shots. He would move this little lipstick camera around so they could look on a monitor, and Marty would say, yes, well, no, I want to change it a little bit this way or that way. Uh, so Rob Legato then went out and miniatures were built, a little village, a little town was built so that the plane could come crashing through it. And again, you have to have tremendous amount of experience to know the perspective, to make sure you get the perspective of everything right. Because if you're dealing with a little miniature town and a miniature plane, you have to know how to shoot it so that it doesn't look like a miniature town and a miniature plane. So they had already come up with some pretty spectacular uh, shots and Rob had put some of that together in a previs so I had a basic draft of it to work with but then we did we did change it a bit uh, but it takes tremendous amount of thinking by Marty and the visual effects people to pull a sequence like that off pre-planning tremendous amount of pre-planning and then of course I'm just using a tiny little snippet <laughs> of, uh, of a shot that's probably taken them a day to get you know uh, the plane going through the crashing through the, the buildings, for example. That wonderful shot is, is actually a miniature building uh, and a miniature plane. But if you use just the right amount of it, it's totally believable. burns to 78% of his body. Nine ribs are shattered, not broken, shattered. As are his nose, his chin, his cheek, his left knee, his left elbow. He has 60 lacerations on his face to the bone. Uh, John Riley, we worked together on Gangs of New York, but um, um, I felt that John was, uh, has a warmth about him and a, um, a technical command of the technique, acting technique that's extraordinary, and, and that he has a touch, so that he was able to give us that touch of uh, of the Noah Dietrich Howard Hughes relationship, where ultimately, because Howard had lost his father too at an early age, that Noah almost becomes like a father to him or an older brother, and you can sense that with John. I'm terribly sorry. The, the crash of the XF-11 into Beverly Hills actually occurred, and there's actual footage uh, from the time of, uh, of uh, an actor, I forget his name, 
uh, walking through the houses that have been hit and showing people what it looked like. Uh, Hughes was unbelievably badly hurt in that crash, uh, and it's a miracle that he survived. I think only a man with his drive and ambition uh, could have pulled himself out of that. Uh, he, as is stated in the in the film, he, he was hurt so badly that his heart was moved from one side of his chest to the other. So there was massive uh, reconstructive surgery that had to be done, and which uh, forever changed the look of him. And that's why he started wearing a mustache because he had a very bad scar on his on his lip. And uh, he, it really, of course, accentuated what was already a decline into mental illness. Um, and uh, even as you see him fighting to pull himself together on crutches and finally ending up with him going into the Senate hearing room, uh, you, you sense that, that the terrible physical damage to him uh, is helping to pull him down mentally as well. Uh, it's amazing that he recovered as well as he did. You see footage of him actually on the Hercules. He looks as if he's moving quite normally. I don't know how he did it. I have to know what you want me to do. Should I release the staff? How far? From, from finishing. About six months. No, no. In money. Seven million. Maybe more. A billion. I think Leonardo's job in portraying Hughes was so challenging because it, it required an actor to immerse himself and locate himself in a life that's tortured and to take things to the same to the extremes that Hughes took them. Um, and I'm thinking about this, you know, the, the days and nights and weeks spent in the screening room on Romaine. Um, the episodes, the fears, and to really understand those and build those within yourself. When you leave the set at night, you don't leave that stuff, you know, in the dressing room. It goes home with you, so you're living it, and it gets it gets uh, it's anguishing, and it occupies you for a whole time. And that's what Leo was willing to do. They're just awful little creatures. But, uh, but these ones. I wanted to see these ones every day. <sighs> Can white elephants really fly? That's everybody's question. He wanted question. so badly to help the war effort, and uh, this plane, with eight huge engines, was designed to fly tanks and entire, you know, regiments of people uh, directly to Europe and land on water because there would have been no. Uh, airport big enough to handle it, so he designed it to land on water uh, and then unload at a critical point before a battle huge numbers of men and, and tanks and machinery that was needed. Uh, and uh, it's just very sad that it never came to fruition. By the time he finished it, because of his mental problems, uh, it it was too late and the war was over. But it was a it was really quite a masterful thing to have built. Keep us grounded until they finish investigating the Reading crash. Could be months. Jesus. We saw Howard Hughes as a visionary, and a visionary who projected himself into the vanguard of the new. And you have to understand that somebody whose life is dedicated to the newest industry dreaming, Hollywood and all its glamour, and, and aviation, the two newest things that you could think of. And that's where he put himself. You know, and secondly, um, uh, in projecting himself into the in, into the new, in the most radical of ways, uh, he was pushing his imagination and, and to project the future, to see the future of streamlining, the design of a fuselage, countersunk rivets, and it kind of works with also his ta uh, his take on what's central. So you can almost imagine Rita Hayworth in her hair and the shape of the H1. You know, and it's a sensuality that seems to be there. But he dwells at this point between, um, between this kind of hypercharged imagination of his that he's pushing out there and madness. Ava Gardner realizes that he's been bugging her bedroom 
everything in her house, actually. Uh, I think it's wonderful the way Howard is standing there uh, with his cane and moving stiffly, even when she knocks him down, the way he gets up and, and, and comes out of the house. There's something terribly moving. I think you feel very deeply for him there, partially because of the fact that he's been so badly wounded. Uh, and, of course, his l total lack of comprehension of why she would be <laughs> upset by this is, is... The humor in that scene is quite amazing. I think Leo did a beautiful, beautiful job. Why do you mean all the bugs? There's more. How many? I don't know, 12, 12 maybe, and... Uh... Marty did a brilliant job in bringing these actors into into recreating Ava Gardner of Catherine Hepburn and uh, you know in particular and those are very very difficult that's, that's like creating Frank Sinatra I mean that's hard and it's um, and and I know what he did he did it from the, the 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 quintessence of the person meaning the attitude the Ava Gardner attitude um, this kind of earthy sensual woman who was uh, kind of bohemian and liberated way beyond, way in advance of her time. And uh, Catherine Hepburn as this outrageous patrician free thinker, this free spirit who wanted to demonstrate it. It's a very complex construction. Get out! See if we get a right side. Take out all the bugs, huh? Except for the one on the bedroom phone. So that the FBI are at the house. This is outrageous! Everything in these offices is the private property of Hughes Productions. The sequences of the FBI uh, continuously invading Howard's home, we uh, messed around with quite a bit in the editing because we found that the more jagged and jumbled and the more it seemed as if it was a continuous invasion, the better it would be because for Hughes to have his home, uh, being such an intensely private man, uh, for Hughes to have his home invaded like that and have people uh, picking up everything that, that he cared so much about and, and putting out cigarettes on the floor and uh, tracking mud into his house was just horrifying. But there was nothing he could do about it. So what we did was we actually jumbled up the imagery and the, the, the passage of time a bit. And we just used whatever images worked for us to um, give his feeling of horror at what was going on and, and the the way they're just even invading his garbage cans and the horror of that. I've always wanted to work with Alan Alda because I wanted to have somebody who is sensible in a way. And Alan has a very charming way about him. And, and uh, here I think he really, he plays it um, in a very reasonable way. There's no reason in the world why Howard shouldn't, I mean, this is what he perceives as Senator Brewster. There's no reason in the world why Howard, you should continue to to buck us on this, you should come in. You should you should play ball with us on this. It's going to work out, you know. Especially after winning World War II, quote unquote. You know, uh, they weren't going to take anything from him. Nicely decorated. Thank you. Yeah, have a seat. Thanks. Thanks for coming by. I just thought you and I should have a chance to talk. Well, Marty about loved the uh, idea of uh, the lunch scene. You know, uh, it's quite clear that Hughes is a little that. odd right in the beginning when. Um, Alan Ald is trying to have a conversation with him, and there's this long silence from Hughes. And uh, I think so, what Marty wanted to show is that Alan Ald is getting a little nervous about the idea of having lunch with this man. But the the way he carries it off, knowing, as the audience does, that he's already set things up to upset Hughes terribly by putting his finger uh, print mark on the glass and uh, having that dreadful, the, the wonderful reveal Marty does of the, the cover of uh, coming off the fish and you see this fish and jelly it looks so disgusting. Uh, I thought Leo was wonderful the way he reacted to that and, and the way he eats it was just fantastic. Uh, and, he, and then Alan Alda's uh, sort of getting a little depressed because he sees that all these tricks he's, he's used haven't worked. And the wonderful sequence of, of Howard looking at the llama painting and Marty's, we always loved it, we referred to the POV of the painting, that down angle that Marty wanted to use of the both of them looking up at that painting and, and Alda not understanding at all why Hughes is so interested in it. And the way Leo did the lines in that kind of weird high-pitched voice that Hughes sometimes had. Uh, it's very, very bizarre. Good. Okay, now let's go have some lunch. Now, do you, 
Do you actually get to see any llama? Rather than playing the no, villain as no, a villain, it should have been played as a person who had reason on his side. That's all. Because uh, reason and also a kind of amiability, a kind of, a kind of likability in a way. He was a guy to talk to, an easy guy to talk to, you know, reasonable person. Yeah, he, he totally believed in what he was saying, yeah. He was also, you know, in the pocket of Pan Am, but he believed in what he was saying. It's brook trout. Hope you like fish. I think those performances are so courageous because as an actor, he has to in internalize the disorder of Hughes. And you don't leave it in a dressing room, you take it home with you. It really has to take over your life. And it just does, if you're really gonna, you know, jump in the deep end of the swimming pool the way Leonardo did. I know you're not drinking. The second thing is that the whole of the movie is, is Hughes, the internal Hughes, externalized. That's the movie. We try and locate the audience. Marty does a brilliant job in the splendid way he's mounted his entire operatic film, which is very big, but nevertheless is extremely intimate because he takes us, the audience, and locates us within the experience of being Hughes. So it's the inner Hughes within which we're located, and through that we perceive this epic canvas of Hughes' work. I'd like to save it from that embarrassment. That's very kind of you, Owen. My committee has the power to hold public yeah. here. But I have a feeling, what I liked about Brewster and the way Alan portrayed it was the, uh, um, the sense of a reasonable person, uh, and yet the corruption being so deep, you, want to go down into you know, history that uh, it's something that, uh, uh, if you listen to him for a long enough period of time, you say, yes, it makes sense. What do you want, Owen? You agree to support my CAB bill, and I won't hold public hearings. I can't do that. Why not? I can't do that, Owen. The CAB yeah, Leo was invested anyway. in this guy in 1998 when he walked in my office. He didn't know what about Hughes he was so invested in or what the story should be, but he was just taken with it. And I could tell that it was something about the early Hughes, and I didn't know anything about the early Hughes. And it was, I. That's where the idea came from um, to do Hughes, and then the and then to do Hughes as a, the early part of, of Hughes's life, Hughes as a visionary. Um, but his Leo's work is um, is extraordinary. He was invested in his character from 1998 when he first walked in my office, and what he was excited about was the visionary challenged by forces that would destroy him, and how I, uh, uh, someone could occupy that position in the vanguard of his own life, just pushing himself and pushing himself to for what's new, and at the same time, he's coexisting in a place where imagination and madness are right next to each other, and you can slip and slide from one into the other and not even know it, and that's what's so dangerous about where he pushed himself to as he moved closer and closer to his son, if you like. And, and, uh, and, and Leo was determined to um, make this the, what I think is the, he thinks it's the performance of his career. I don't think so. I think this is the first performance of the next stage in Leo's work. I think 20 years from now, when we look back at a great body of work, we're going to say the, the adult Leonardo DiCaprio's first film in this next phase is Aviator. So I think what we're seeing is the first film on the next stage of great work that's going to come from Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Well, we have, we have a long list of particulars. Chief among them is that he defrauded the American government of $56 million while we were at war, when we could least afford it. While brave men were dying on the beaches of Normandy, Mr. Hughes was picking the pocket of the American taxpayer. I sleep in this room. In the dark. I'll, I'll have him dragged here to Washington if I have to. I want to see the whites of his lies. I have a place. Sleep. No, I mean, he has a lot of questions to answer, son. I have a chair. Particularly about that monstrous boondockle. Is that, uh, <laughs> that model airplane he's building. You know, that flying lumberyard. <laughs> that spruce goose. <laughs> now, we'll get him here. The uh, most difficult sequence for us was the one that, that really displays the obsessive-compulsive disorder in a full-blown 
uh, way, really, and 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 that is that is uh, when uh, Howard is uh, stuck in a screening room uh, and uh, is wandering up and down in the screening room, wondering if he has, needs some sleep and should he drink from the bottle of milk and that sort of thing. Until finally, finally, he's uh, sitting alone in a chair, naked. His beard is growing, his nails are growing, and. Uh, this represents a series of breakdowns that he had during that period. I try to give the impression of what it was like to be him in that room, um, meaning images would come up and flashing lights and these things that are being projected on the screen, scenes from Hell's Angels apparently, and scenes from desert footage that he took for the outlaw, scenes from the outlaw. I mean, at a certain point, is that real footage up on the screen? Is the footage at the end uh, that's being projected on his back uh, in color of the Hell's Angels? First of all, it's not shot in color. Is that real? Is that just, just representing what he's going through, the agony he's going through, you know? So uh, we started out with the, the sequence being somewhat realistic and then stretched it, you know? Uh, ultimately, what I decided would be that it would be an impression of his, himself, that he would have had him, of himself in that, in that room during that. Uh, sometimes these things went on with him, you know, for three or four months in one room, maybe longer in other cases. So. I don't know what time it is in that room. I have no idea where they are. The room gets stretched in length. We added, we added to the walls to make it uh, disorient you, completely disorient you, and you're inside his mind, basically. And so in order for the actor to do that, and for us, the crew, it was a pretty intense uh, shooting days, uh, let alone uh, for the actor having undergone each morning six to seven hours of makeup before getting to that, into the screening room, and then having to do the repetitions. Uh, or the slow movement. Uh, and, uh, you know, when he says, I have a place that I sleep, well, you can say that many different ways. I have a chair that I sleep in. And so we tried many different ways. Uh, we have lots of footage. You know, in fact, I think we cut about five days' worth of shooting out of the picture in that sequence alone. I can hear you, Katie. I can always hear you. Even in the cockpit with the engines on. <laughs> That's because I'm so the goddamn The screening loud. room sequence where Howard really descends into madness was, was something we spent a lot of time on. Again, it had originally been conceived as a much longer sequence. And the, the really uh, difficult thing for us to do in the editing was to try and find a way to still convey the passage of time, the depth to which he has fallen, and yet not take up too much screen time. So we worked like crazy on that sequence, trying all different kinds of edits on it. And finally, just coming up with a, a kinetic uh, uh, approach to it, not worrying about matching shots or anything like that, just jumping into moments that were very good of Leo's acting and the imagery and combining them in a way that just seemed to work emotionally, not necessarily the way it was designed or, or the way uh, it was shot or uh, not worrying about matching or anything like that. We just plunged in and, and tried to go for the emotion. I can take the wheel. Howard? It was most difficult to do because of the intensity of... Uh, uh, the intensity of the concentration that the actor needed how are you, are you and also how that all those different symptoms of OCD sort of came sort of came to uh, fruition in a way how in that sequence and how many to show how many not to show and if we do show them in which way can we do it what is real and what's not real in that sequence It was interesting because he looked uh, uh, like a martyred saint of some sort, a person who was taking on a lot of suffering, you know, and at the same time reminded me of a kind of um, um, an ancient god, the king of the gods that he wanted to be, like Zeus in the temple of Zeus, only uh, um, somehow, uh, 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 should I say, uh, the power of the gods being disintegrated, and he's sitting there with all the corruption inside of him and the beam of light like the, the rising sun behind him, like a halo, you know, but he can't make it anymore. He can't make it. 
Uh, so there were a great number of shots like that that were designed by Marty. Our favorites were the ones where he, he looks either like Jesus Christ or Che Guevara or a combination of the two of them, backlit with uh, bright white light and silhouetted a bit. Uh, it's a startling image um, and a beautiful moment where there's an employee standing at the door and he, he just turns his head to gesture that it's time for the employee to move forward wearing his white gloves. Um, very beautifully thought out by Marty and uh, shot very beautifully. Cue. Uh, a, a lot of the shots are very carefully planned, so it didn't require any editing. For example, when he picks up the urine bottle and goes over and uh, stands by the wall and, and the camera slowly reveals, it's a beautiful shot, uh, all those bottles of <laughs> urine. That's something an editor doesn't have to do anything on. That's already designed. I T. It's about uh, uh, feeling that you have to say a phrase a certain way or a certain amount of times. And what I mean by a certain way is the emphasis has to be in a certain word. And you have to feel that the emphasis is right. Somebody else can't tell you that the emphasis on the third word is right. You have to feel that in your, in your mind. And in the way your tongue, uh, uh, dentalizing against, uh, <laughs> against D's and T's, it has to hit the, the tip of the tongue has to hit the roof of the mouth in a certain way that only you, only you know is right. Let's say that's what you're obsessing about, you know. Uh, so it's, it's totally up to the patient, so to speak. It's up to, it's up to, the, the, uh, to the person with the illness. Uh, what's in her or his mind at that time that constitutes the correct way of, of uh, having One. uttered the phrase. One, right. It tries to control existence and time, and ultimately it's something none of us can do. Um, the fear of... Uh, the fear of uh, being not safe, but we're not safe. We are. We're born, and we're not safe. Um, and this is a this is the journey of life. You know, none of us is safe from anything, any time. Uh, and uh, to be constantly aware of it must be a very hellish experience for the patient, for the the person who, who's suffering from this illness. And uh, then these people come to visit him. Uh, do they really come to visit him? The actual fight and discussion there with the. Uh, uh, one trip. I believe there was a meeting at one point. I mean, by this point now, you're not talking about reality. You're talking about the fictionalization of how he uses life. But the meetings were as strained as that. There's no doubt about it. Um, there were some strange meetings. And uh, I always think, for me, it's a very, I love that scene um, because uh, uh, the uh, nature of what it is to deal in industry. And I mean, I should, I love that scene because the nature of what it is to deal in big business. Or deal with a bit, yeah. Literally, it's like one man speaking, the other man running up and down in a in a room naked, screaming, "You're not going to get TWA." That's basically, that's basically uh, for me what big business is about. But um, uh, as Juan says, "Take care of that cold." So he says, "Oh, I'm going to take care of it." You know, uh, I, I think that represents a certain reality. That that scene with Juan Tripp, but I don't know if it actually happened that way or it's in his mind that way. It it, it kind of stretches the time in, in that sequence. Uh, of the film, um, but uh, the real thing there is the, uh, I think ultimately the shot of him in the chair, Amazing. naked. You, know, you produced a dirty movie and built airplanes that don't fly. Well, <clears throat> that's just not fair, is it? I mean, the XF-11 flew quite well for an hour and 45 minutes. I mean, I wish you were up there with me, Juan. It was, it was exhilarating. Be that as it may, you still have to answer for the spruce goose. It's called the Hercules! And it will fly, It was, God it was it. really a matter of condensing it and, and still getting the emotion and the, the passage he is going through from first entering the screening room and finally ending up, you know, unshaven and no clothes on and out of his mind. I know that, Howard. I know that. But I'm going to get it anyway. You're going to default on your loan from Equitable after Senator Brewster destroys your reputation and you can't find additional capital for the airline. The hearings will also show Hughes aircraft to be mismanaged and incompetent and it will go bankrupt too. But you won't be insolvent, you'll still have Tulco. Perhaps you'll head back to Houston to rebuild your empire. I rather hope you do. By that time, Pan Am will have bought TWA and painted all those magnificent Connies, blue and white. So when you do return, it will be on a Pan Am plane.
I just, I, I think it was just a beautiful idea that Marty had that um, once Howard locks himself away in there, uh, people who are coming to talk to him have to talk to him through the door. And so you have the wonderfully moving sequence in which Kate Hepburn comes to try and help him. And Howard does not want to draw her into his madness, so he encourages her to go away, which is really a very loving act. Uh, and and then the com the comedic way that uh, Marty did the, the business meeting between Howard and Juan Tripp, who, in fact, they had... They had agreed that they would meet and discuss the whole issue of uh, whether one of them was going to buy out the other. But the incredibly funny idea that, that Juan Tripp is sitting there with his briefcase and he's talking. On the other side of the door is a man who is completely naked and uh, completely out of his mind, but pulls himself together just enough to carry out uh, the meeting in a businesslike way, with a lot of humor, of course, as written and, and used by Marty. Thank you, Howard, and you take care of that cold. Oh, don't you worry. I certainly will. Bye-bye. In fact, we always talked about showing the Howard used in the 70s and showing the Howard used in the 60s and that sort of thing, and John, had, John Logan had gone through so much of that, and he decided not to. And that was my first instinct when I read the script. What I liked about it was that we did not show that Howard used, because that's the one we always hear about, and it's kind of mysterious. It's a very interesting mystery. But also, you know, if you read every day, what happened to him. I mean, ultimately, dramatically, it isn't that interesting. Um, and uh, it's fascinating, but it's morbidly fascinating, I think. One has to be careful with it. And so once, but we had still went back and questioned John and talked about uh, adding um, scenes at the beginning and the end of the older Howard Hughes and that sort of thing. And he went through the process with us until we came to see, during the shooting of the sequence at the uh, screening room, when I saw the rushes and realized that is the Howard of the 1970s. That is the Howard that he's going to become. We've already done it. The white gloves are so interesting. They, uh, they have a feeling of uh, something official and clean and protective, you know? It's like editing gloves from the old days when they'd be cutting negative, you'll see that then they still do and they cut negative and they, they always wear, the, the editors wear white gloves. There's always something very beautiful about that, I thought. And then I decided that we should have an intimation of these caretakers, quote-unquote, at the end of the film. Um, I don't know if the caretakers are really there. You know, he starts to hallucinate anyway. And uh, they're just the people, pretty much they, they represent to me the people who are going to be taking care of him for the rest of his life and ultimately take control of him. Those who know the real story, the rest of the story, take control, uh, um, take advantage of him, so to speak. There's a lot, there's a lot, of, a lot of that's been written about his last few years, uh, especially with the, under the care of these, these different men. How nice of you to dress for me. Can I come in? Yeah. Yeah, you can come in. Thank you for coming. I don't know how he did it. He just seems to have had this ability throughout his life to pull himself out of his madness and face uh, reality at times when he really needed to. And the morning of the actual Senate hearings, the first day, according to people who have written about this in books, that uh, Howard Hughes was so deaf that he couldn't hear them banging on the door to wake him up. Uh, he was in not very good shape, and they had to get him up out of bed. They had to break the door down and, and get him up and wash him and get him dressed properly. And... Uh, drive him to the Senate hearing, but he somehow he was he was able to do it. If you look at the actual footage, it's quite amazing to see him perform. And of course that was studied thoroughly by by Marty and, and by Leo for for the sequence. Let me look at you. When do you go to Washington? Uh, a week. Of course, many people say today he would have been on medication and it wouldn't have been such a problem, but on the other hand, sometimes those medications cut your creative ability. And that might have meant that, yes, he might have been medicated, but would he have been able to do the great work he was doing? So it's, it's a difficult issue. There's nothing there, Howard. I know, baby. 
Rinse your face off now. Put your hands in the water and wash off the soap. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. Does that look clean to you? Nothing's clean, Howard. But we do our best, right? Research uh, is very, very important for Marty. Uh, massive amounts of research are done on all of his films, and books are prepared by Marianne Bauer, our researcher and archivist. Uh, she prepares books for Marty, particularly on a film like Gangs, where she has massive amount, numbers of photographs and uh, first-person accounts. Marianne Bauer didn't need to do as much work on Howard Hughes um, because it, it wasn't such a massive uh, period of time. But... Uh, she, again, prepared books and collected all the videotaped uh, material there was on Hughes, particularly for the Senate hearing. And uh, Marty wanted to make the room as believable as he could, the, the way the, the, the Senate hearing would have occurred in that time. So the, the, since it was one of the first televised Senate hearings, he made a big deal, as you can see in the opening of the, of the sequence, of the lights coming on that are needed for television, which are, television needed much more light than, say, just still photographers did. And because, again, it's a violation for Howard, for him to have to be in front of people like that was horrifying. And, of course, Senator Brewster knew that. Uh, that's exactly why he had threatened to bring him there, hoping that he would never come. And so the violation of Howard is again seen with those bright lights coming on and, and Marty actually whiting out Howard's face with the lights and then the wonderful idea of, of everyone wearing sunglasses because the lights were so bright in those days that people literally wore sunglasses during the hearing, the reporters and a lot of the people there. And so Marty makes a wonderful shot where you see Howard watching two reporters putting their sunglasses on and the sound effects editor puts a sizzle sound in at that moment which is just great uh, so Marty also wanted to dwell on details of all the still cameras uh, television cameras recording the event so we have all these uh, wonderful shots uh, pushing in on lenses and Howard reflected in the lens looking at himself and deciding what he's going to do is he going to go along and play this game uh, in the normal way of answering questions, or is he just going to attack? And he decides, after looking at himself reflected in that lens, he decides to attack. He just became the part. I think particularly by the time you get into the Senate, you just completely believe he's Howard Hughes. And the, the, the way he behaves in the Senate is just so incredible. I, I think I've already said this, but uh, the, I, I just love the fact that when you see him there for the first time, uh, a little bit more pulled together because we've been seeing him mainly in the, the screening room where he's completely out of his mind. Uh, the uh, way that, that he shows how, he, uh, the way that Leo um, wanted to do his makeup and hair uh, it shows how hard Howard Hughes is trying to pull himself together. So the part in his hair, I just, I burst out laughing when I first saw it because it is so precise. It looks like it's been made with a slide rule. And his hair is so plastered down as if he's trying to pull himself together to get through this ordeal, which he does so magnificently. And the hectoring way he goes after the senator, <laughs> which was, I guess, very typical of Hughes. Um, is, is just beautifully done by Leo, and it was quite exhausting for him because he had to do those t a lot of those takes all in one. Marty wanted particularly to do his his speech about the, the Hercules, which he loved so much, in one medium shot, uh, not cut in for close-ups or side angles, have him do it all in one. That was extremely hard to do, and he did it so beautifully, so movingly. Why your press agent would pay out more than $170,000. In, um, uh, in the hearings, uh, uh, he actually was pulled together. He uh, was pulled together by his friends, apparently, and uh, uh, many, it's written about in many books. And he did appear in Washington, and he did, literally, it's almost, that's almost word for word from the transcripts and from the actual black and white footage that we saw that's available 
of the uh, Senate investigation. Um, and he, uh, in fact, when I first read it, I couldn't quite believe it. But that's pretty much it. And when I saw the actual film and his speeches, particularly about the one in which he says, uh, I put the sweat of my life into that plane, and I will leave the country, and I mean it. That's almost word for, almost word, for word. And so um, I find it fascinating because he had to break through his illness. And you, you could see it. And if you look at the black and white footage of him, you could see him almost. He's, he's containing himself somehow, you know. Uh, but they had those hot lights on him. They knew what they were doing. They were putting him on the spot, making him crazy, so to speak. And, uh, and I thought I'd play that up. And will he get through this? Will he get through the Senate or not? Um, many people who aren't ill can't get through that, but he did. And I think that also showed his extraordinary determination, and obsession, with what he believed to be right about what he did with the planes. You know, he said he wasn't. He said he may have been many things: uh, playboy, uh, uh, capricious, whatever, eccentric. Uh, but he's not a liar. He said in that case he wasn't lying. Maybe he was a liar in other things, but he wasn't a liar in that case. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> he seemed to make it through. I just felt he was a man of conviction, and, and he he uh, actually made his uh, made his point. Aircraft companies do it now. I don't know whether it's a good system Alan or not. Alan Aldous, uh, his, it was so much fun kind of Alan Aldous footage because he's a very fertile actor. Maybe from being on television and on the stage, I don't know, but he, he does each take differently and you see him enjoying very much trying to figure out another way to get the humor across. So that was a, just a delight to work with him and uh, the, the, the way he reacts to Leo in the Senate is, is just so funny and... Uh, uh, interesting because he doesn't do it in a he, he does it with a lot of humor and that that helps the sequence enormously and he's he's a very good improviser so he was wonderful at at trying to fend off this incredible barrage from Hughes who once he locks in it's like a, a laser beam trying to destroy you and he was so good at, at the way he with his body language and his mannerisms and uh, his frustrations, the way he showed them was, was just beautiful. I mean, he spoke to me as if you worked for him. The Senate hearing was, of course, a tremendous amount of fun to work on because the actors are just so phenomenal. I, Leo just completely caught what Howard Hughes was like at that time. There is actual video footage of those hearings and the intensity uh, right from the beginning when you first see him and you understand that he is trying to control him Self, because he was actually, he was able to pull himself out of very bad periods of madness when he knew he, when he had to. So you can imagine the, the way he pulled himself together to, to perform there in front of those cameras, and I thought Leo just captured it so beautifully. And of course, Alan Alda with his wonderful improvisations and uh, very fertile acting style. Um, he... He just has a, a, a wonderful ability to react to another actor and uh, just improvise. And so you get the two of these guys together. They were just so wonderful. It was so much fun to cut that footage, but we did have to cut it down. We had more than you see, uh, and we did have to cut it down. And that, that became difficult uh, because it was hard to, to do it and make it still see the passage of time. Uh, the long ordeal that Howard Hughes is going through. And then we decided that the Hercules, the, the, the beginning of him getting into the Hercules and starting it, it up and taxiing and then finally flying it uh, might work better if we intercut it with something else. So we decided to try intercutting it with the Senate. And that was a big gamble because it was a very unorthodox thing to do. Uh, but what happened when we did it is that when we find, when we do intercut the Hercules and you see him in that plane, how big it is, what a, a ridiculous idea it is to think that a plane that big made of wood is going to fly. Uh, and then you go back into the Senate and he tells you how he feels about the Hercules. It just worked 100% better because you had seen him in it and you knew what it meant to him now. Uh, and so it made Leo's wonderful tour de force speech, which Marty shot in a medium shot, all one take, and Leo had to do that in one take. It's very hard. Uh, and it just worked beautifully after we intercut the Hercules and, and the Senate. We, we didn't expect it to work as well as it did. Uh, and we screened it that way, and some people liked it, some people didn't, but we finally decided that was definitely the way to go. Uh, Leo, after he was through with one of those long takes, he would just go, oh, because he was so exhausted from the intensity of trying to get through that long speech without making a mistake and doing it right, uh, that uh, it, it, was, it was really hard.
One's good. Two's good. Three's good. Four's good. Five's good. Six is good. Seven's good. Eight's good. Advancing Master Throttles. Advancing Master Throttles. Probably know by now. I have to do a great deal of screaming here. We recreated um, the exterior of it, just enough of it, so that uh, in actual size, so that you could see Howard standing in front of it at the after he's flown it, uh, and he invites Ava Gardner to go to Paris with him, and then loses his mind again. Uh, so that exterior part was built almost full scale, I think, but basically we built the interior of the cockpit. Uh, and that was mounted on a gimbal, which meant that it could be shaken all the time very effectively, I must say, because, of course, when a plane takes off on water, I've taken off on a small plane on water, and it's quite uh, bruising. <laughs> I mean, the plane is banging against the waves, and so the gimbal that this entire huge set was mounted on could be shaken, um, and it gives you a wonderful feeling of, of the terror of everybody wondering who's inside that plane is this thing actually going to take off <laughs> and Howard those beautiful up angles of Howard shaking you know really vigorously as he's trying to get the thing to as he's taxiing down to take off wonderful shots uh, so they had to figure out ways to keep the camera from shaking like that so all those shots had to be constructed so that the camera was free of the shaking of the gimbal I would say that we have a 15 knot wind would you call that a headwind, Professor? He had this immense courage to, to seek what he didn't know, define his boundaries, and then go invent the method by which he could acquire that knowledge. He wasn't intimidated by not knowing. He was challenged by not knowing. And then he struggled to define precisely what I don't know, and then how am I going to find out about it? Get me this expert, this expert, this expert. I want to learn all about it. None. Would you lean a little closer to the microphone, sir? None. Did you receive $13 million to manufacture a prototype of a flying boat known as the Hercules? <clears throat> I did. And did you deliver that plane? I did not. So by your admission in this, in this chamber, Mr. Hughes, you have received $56 million from the United States government for planes you never delivered. That is correct. I think Marty built this world, and he understands this world, and he, he has a sense of, of largeness, a, a kind of a, a operatically theatrical quality that, uh, that he's drawn to. And, and the use of music of this film is brilliant. You know, it, it just is really, really beautiful work. And he was absolutely the right choice. He was the right man to direct this picture. See, the thing is... Now, Mr. Hughes, your personal finances are, are not... Let him, let him speak. Right, proceed, Mr. Hughes. See, the thing is, I care very much about aviation. It has been the great joy of my life. That's why I put my own money in these planes, and I've lost millions, Senator Brewster, and I'll go on losing millions. It's just what I do. Now, if I've lost a lot of the government's money during the war, well, I hope folks will put that into perspective. You see, more than 60 other airplanes ordered from such firms as Lockheed, Douglas, Northrop, and Boeing never saw action either. In all, more than $800 million was spent during the war on planes that never flew. Over $6 billion on other weapons that were never delivered. Yet, Hughes Aircraft, with her $56 million, is the only firm the picture under is a investigation grand today. Now epic, and it's a tragedy where and where it ends, and 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 the the intimacy with which we're connected to Hugh's feelings of what he's striving towards, and and how how new and exciting it is what he's striving for. And we know that his vision is accurate, that the future of aviation is this, that the future of cinema is this. He's right, and he's seeing it before anybody, and then he's making that, then he's making that happen. And all the things that Hughes did, we take for granted now. But they were the first, the first transcontinental airline, the first carrier that's both domestic and, and, and international. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the um, 
streamlining, uh, just countersinking the rivets, the, uh, his perception both in technology, the uplifting bra, if you like, for Jane Russell and Outlaw, um, where cinema went, what intensity is in cinema, and he brings us the very first Stanislavski performance, which later becomes called, in the actor's studio, method acting. So you see Muni do Scarface, and you're seeing a really powerful form of what later is going to be Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and Montgomery Clift and Marlon Brando. And you're seeing it first, because Hughes brings it to you in Scarface with Paul Muni. And you're seeing in, in the epical film in, in, uh, in Hell's Angels. Uh, you know, it, it, the guy's extraordinary. And a lot of what he did we take for, we take for granted now, and, he, and it's not connected to him. But in fact, he's an, he was an astounding innovator. Hearings are over. The airline bill will be defeated in the Senate. The TWA will begin flights from New York to Paris, and then on to Moscow, to Japan, to Hawaii, to Los Angeles, to New York. Power coming up! Power coming up! Power kills, it's just the learn of it. She has asked everyone to hold on. Tremendous horsepower, ticking up. Let me hear it, over. 25 miles per hour! 30! Here we go! Here we go! 35! Indicator. That's both up to 25. The backgrounds were put in by uh, visual effects. Uh, Rob Bogato, our, our visual effects man, went out to the actual place where Howard took off and photographed all kinds of images that could then be placed in the windows. Um, and then he, he photographed a, a model of the uh, Hercules uh, in real sunlight, and that was then composited with images of the background and the water. To, to make it seem as if the plane is, is actually taxing. And then he also had it flown by remote control. There was a model I had which was being flown over the water by remote control. And, and so the skill of the visual effects supervisor is to combine all of these elements successfully, make sure you shoot them in the right scale so they're believable, um, combine all these things together and make it all work. And it, it's quite a job. It's a long process. It's difficult to describe because people think, oh, we got it from a doctor or you got it from a guy who really had OCD. No, it's not that simple. Uh, it's based on what John Logan wrote. And Logan was able to, as I say, uh, layer it into the script in such a way that it, it withstood the um, scrutiny of the doctors and, and uh, the people who actually have OCD. They really withstood that. Plus, they helped us add to it. And when we added to it, we also realized that we were adding maybe too much. So we'd shoot and then do a, a version which had more than less and that sort of thing. We sort of had a chart of the whole movie and which aspect of OCD would be manifested in that scene. The one that's in the script, which passed, uh, passed the tests of all the experts, plus we can add this, plus we can add touching the left, um, left uh, pant leg. He was always doing that. Uh, and how many times should we do that? And when we do it, When's the first time we should really see it? And if we see it in the first time, should it be a little less? Should it be something that you hardly notice? Like, for example, when he's getting his picture taken after Hell's Angels uh, is a big hit and he stands out there and all the people are screaming and he, he sort of overexposes his face, goes white, and you see him just touch his pant leg a little bit. Um, that was, I think, the first time you see it in the film. I may be wrong, but that's the first time. And we layered it in throughout the picture um, so that we had a chart based on what, you know, what scrutiny, uh, what, um, through, based on the research with Dr. Schwartz and, and uh, the person who had OCD. But again, this is pretty well based upon what John had in that script already. And uh, uh, yet, I, the preparation is important because in order to get, in order to get him to behave in the right way, or what he felt was right too when he was doing it, um, he had to call upon, he just had to call upon these symptoms uh, he had to call upon these symptoms uh, instantaneously. And I mean instantaneously. We shot for 91 days, but we didn't shoot in continuity. So that 
maybe two days of the week he'd be 26 years old, and the other two days he'd be 40. Then another, you know. So we had to basically say, okay, how much here and how much there? And we had to constantly be dialing it up and dialing it down. So he had to have almost like a like a computer in his head to uh, to understand how much to show and how 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 much not to show. And also he had to put himself in a in the mind process of being stuck in a certain way, being stuck, not being able to touch the doorknob, being stuck, repeating, show me all the blueprints. And in going through that. And going through that process in his mind, he almost becomes like a person with the illness. You know, I, I, it's very interesting you know, because of what the Dr. Schwartz said. It almost became like a person when we were working together. He said it was like a person who actually, actually, was, he was actually going through the suffering of a person who, who would have that illness, and um, take after take. And so it was a very, as I say, he's a young man. So, <laughs> you know, uh, being young, I think it's a very, uh, um, you know. Uh, demanding performance. And so, because he's young, uh, he could really, I mean, because, he, because he had that preparation, because he had, was so obsessed by the character, uh, he was able to channel it and uh, be able, as far as I could tell, to take the, uh, uh, take the uh, emotional and psychological and physical wear and tear. Well, I think many great artists have been people who perhaps are not uh, easy to live with. And I think uh, sometimes, because because great artists are so sensitive to life, and that's why they're so good, uh, life is sometimes very difficult for them. And I I think this is a very moving portrait of a man who had so much to give but was so crippled. And that's very typical, really, of a lot of... I, I, I think it's lovely that Marty is showing us, in a way, how we can care about someone who who was so difficult and strange and, and afflicted, but that we can still care about him. The way of the future. And then finally, at the end of the film, too, when he talks about the way of the future, the way of, the future. The way of his future is interesting, the way of the future. Uh, because it has, his future will definitely be marred, so to speak, you know? But he seems to accept it at the end. In my mind, when, he, when he's caught repeating the way of the future, it's almost as if he, um, he knows that he paid that price, and he'll continue to pay a harder, a, a tougher price, a more serious price, even. And yet, he seems to be that he accepts that he should pay the price. In other words, if he was ever given a chance, knowing that this would happen in your life, would you ever do it all over again? I think he would have said yes. You know, to deal with that fatal flaw and to succumb to it finally is what happened. Succumb to it. You know, and as I say, that fatal flaw given it's in his genes. Why? Who knows? It's 